Hello there, folks, and welcome back to Answer the Question with Chris White and Rob Hutchison. Rob is going to be a few minutes late. He had an interview scheduled with SABC, the state broadcaster in South Africa. So we're waiting for Rob to come in. In the meantime, I'll try to keep you entertained and informed as best I can. You know me, I'm never prepared for a broadcast. I have nothing to talk about. And we scramble for topics to raise. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I thought I'd wear some HSBC 7s kit today, uh, and I'm wearing some for South Africa. This is from Vegas. It was made for the Las Vegas 7s, so you won't find it anywhere else. It's a kind of like a hoodie, and it's actually kind of warm. I'm um, kind of cooking right now. South Africa with the imprints there. You can see the 7s, USA 7s symbol right there. There you go, USA 7s. And then you've got the uh, South African flag on there, so it's pretty cool. And over here you have the South Africa for the Vegas 7s. Cool. Anyway, so yeah, um, that's what I'm wearing today. And that's uh, because the Singapore 7s starts tomorrow night. Friday here on the East Coast US, Saturday on points further eastward. Singapore, of course, will be the next day. They're 12 hours ahead of the East Coast of the United States. So I'll be covering matches five through eight in the opening round. And then in the morning, I'll be covering the tail end of those things. So it'll be evening in Singapore. You can catch that here. And in most matches I'm covering, which I mentioned yesterday, let me get to those very quickly and let you guys know which ones are. Actually, do I have it here listed? Let me see. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Uh, just a second. YouTube. Let me get to my other browser. Sylvester Celine, where you been, man? Very busy. Okay, good to see you there. Right. Um, so... Wow, um, Momoland, Boom Boom Nancy got 12 million views from three years ago. Wow, I need to shake my booty to get some serious. Craziest moments in women's football. Okay, I'm going to have to get myself uh, some of that uh, some of that action there. Get myself some big time views. Show a little. Oh, oh, oh wait a second. Now she's showing. Uh -huh, I knew it. Just a matter of time. Ella Fry, the Dutch girl who pretends to be a little anime Why interpreters Japanese, want this? Is, um, is now wow. getting like... Uh, She's doing lingerie stuff now. I knew that was coming, just a matter of time. But anyway, back to what I was trying to find out here. So for the uh, Sevens tournament, what I've got uh, going on in Singapore. Oh, I lost a subscriber on my Rugby Ascendant. Ooh, that sucks. Went from 740 to 739. Not sure why that is. But uh, for the Singapore Sevens, which is tomorrow, let's take a look here. I got um, the first four match I'll be covering is England versus Spain. That's early in the morning for South Africans at 5.28 in the morning. It'll be 11.28 in the evening here at Friday, Saturday morning for South Africans. Australia versus Samoa. That's at 23.50 or 5.50. USA versus Kenya, 12 minutes after midnight or 6.12 in the morning in South Africa. And South Africa versus Canada. The Blitzbach try to continue their undefeated streak. And they are now, I think, third on the log for longest uh, consecutive undefeated streak in Sevens history uh, behind two uh, All Blacks teams. So South Africa versus Canada at, at 1234 in the morning, 34 minutes after midnight, and 634 in the morning. So I'll be doing that, HSBC Sevens, live reaction and commentary right here on, well, not right here, on Rugby Ascendant, excuse me. So not right here, on Rugby Ascendant. So feel free to tune into that, folks, and check it out. That's coming up. Just waiting for Rob Hutchison to join us. Uh, he is, as I said, had an interview with SABC. I don't know if it was at the studio or if he's doing it from home. And no doubt he's talking about uh, the RSA and the response to this uh, gazetting of regulations in South Africa. So a couple of programming announcements beyond that. Uh, for those who are curious about my plans uh, to travel for Major League Rugby, I've taken a look at it and I've tentatively settled on a trip to Texas to cover two Major League Rugby games. Of course, that's contingent on the press credentials, but even if they don't, I'll go anyway. Uh, but uh, June 3rd and June 4th, I'll fly to Houston, which is a direct flight from Harrisburg, so that makes it simpler for me. I'll fly to Houston to watch Houston play Austin. And the uh, Fairweather Rugby fan who lives, uh, excuse me, I'll fly to, excuse me, uh, correction, correction, I'll fly to Dallas. There's a direct flight to Dallas from here with American. I'll fly to Dallas. I'll pick up a rental car. I'll drive from Dallas to Houston. And I'll link up with Dean Chansey in Houston as long as he's available. And I'll be down there in Houston. I'll be down there Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday night. The game is Friday night. Maybe I can get Dean to go to a rugby game. Wouldn't that be cool? 
and that'll be Houston versus Austin on June 3rd. And then on June 4th, I'll drive back for a Saturday evening game. That's Dallas versus the Utah Warriors in Dallas. That takes care of That's also the last weekend of regular season for Major League Rugby. So that'll get me down there to cover both of those games and make it feasible. I've never been to Houston. I have been to Dallas, so it'll be interesting for me. And I'll take a few extra days uh, each side if possible so I can do coverage of Texas for my viewers. So there you go, folks. Um, anyone else in Texas would like to link up with me, let me know. I'll be in Dallas and Houston uh, that week. That's the plan. I just got to go ahead and start booking flights and uh, getting hotels. Hotels are easy. Rental car shouldn't be too hard, but the flights uh, could be problematic. So working on that, folks. So, uh, yeah, the plan would be to go to Houston. I'll spend Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night in Houston. Uh, Friday night attending the uh, Houston game versus Austin Elite. And um, I'll link up with uh, Dean Chancey as long as he's in town. Uh, we'll go to his garage studio and uh, maybe do a live stream from there, touch base with everybody, do some interviews, do some footage, walk around Houston, and maybe Dean and I will sing his song together, and then they'll drown out my horrible voice by putting Dean's soundtrack over top of it. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool, folks? But thank you all of you for tuning in. If you're waiting for Rob Hutchison, Rob is delayed by SABC. I'm hoping he'll show up. Uh, he hasn't read the message I sent him yet. So I'm just waiting to hear back from him. So anyway, so if we don't have Rob, I do have some news to cover, and I'll get into that uh, here shortly. But that's the plan. I I'm also contemplating a plan to Utah. And it looks like the most promising time is going to be either the, the 21st of May uh, that week. So I'm not sure about flight connections to Utah. Uh, that's always the long pole in the tent. So let me see. Uh, so from um, M -N -M -M MDT, which is Harrisburg, to Salt Lake City. Flights MDT to Salt Lake City. Uh, let's see. Uh, no direct flights. It's all connections. Ugh. Ugh. If I drive to Philadelphia, it's nonstop, but that's four hours, six hours of driving back and forth to Philadelphia, plus paying $15 a day or $20 a day for parking. I don't think so. So I'll have to see. Um, hmm. Yeah, so we got some. Uh, let me see if I can find a better connection here. But uh, that's to Salt Lake to cover the Utah Warriors. So, oh, no, there is a one-way flight. How the heck is that? One-way flight. Who? United. Oh, well, son of a gun. There you go. All right. Son of a gun. Oh, no, wait, that's this one. That's not direct. That's one way. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading, the, reading it incorrectly. Reading incorrectly. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Let me pick the date. So let me just go. That would be if I did that. That's um, May 21st. So let's go May 21st. Let's go around May 19th. Coming back on May, May 22nd. Let's try that. Done. Let's see what happens there. We'll search for it. See what happens. I don't think there's any direct flights to Salt Lake City. It's not a major route between Harrisburg. So Harrisburg only has major flights to places like D.C., Atlanta, um, and um, Dallas, places like that. Everything else is a connection. Yeah, um, you know, six hours is the best I can do. Go through Chicago or go through Newark. Ugh, ugh, and it's expensive. Six hundred dollars. Look, Utah might be falling off the table there, folks. Six hundred bucks for the flight with United. I don't like United. They're not very, they're not the friendly skies they claim to be. Anyway, folks, thanks for tuning in. How are we doing? We lost four viewers. Sorry to see you leave so quickly. Were you bored that fast? <laughs> Again, waiting for, um, for Rob Hutchison to join us. And it's an apropos time for this conversation because we need to talk about um, the progress of people's responses against the gazetting of permanent rules that will turn you into serfs of the ANC state. Hendo is here at the outset. Eric is here as well. Hello, Erica. And then we got uh, Jacques Smith. Uh, who else we got here? Um, Ants is back. Ants, good to see you again. You're a less frequent viewer, but we always appreciate you being here. I know you're a busy guy. Cameron Heslop is back. Cameron um, must not be writing right now. Good to see you again. Oh, he finished an article today, so he's got time on his hands. Cool. And Leo Vignanza von Rendsburg. Hello, Beth Frazier. Young ladies, good to see you there. And then Mr. B is back. Always a pleasure, Mr. B. Mr. B is challenging Leovin for the ultimate super chatter on this program. <laughs> Thought I'd mention that. Uh, let's see who else we got here. And in the chat, we have Bob. Always a pleasure, Bob. Great to see you back again. I noticed you were here the other day. And Wolf just had lamb curry. Ugh, I don't eat lamb, man. Mama. <laughs> 
I don't eat lamb. <laughs> and Sylvester's back. Uh, Sylvester has some interesting news. I've been booked into a mental hospital with two suicide attempts. That's going, what? What? Sylvester, oh my goodness. No, 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 no. Don't do that, man. Don't do that. No, don't, 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 don't. No, that's, there's, there's, there's no such thing as no hope. If, if, if you're, if you're, if you're depressed, if you're bummed out, come here. Let us try to cheer you up. Um, no, no, no. The, the world will be a, a poorer place with your absence, Sylvester. I mean, look how much we miss the right Reverend Rawhide in the brew, you know? And um, they went, they, well, I assume the right Reverend Rawhide has passed. We've not heard from him in well over a year, but we know the brew passed. So, yeah. And um, we just saw the, um, the disappearance from this earth of Gareth Mason, a wonderful human being. Sylvester, please um, take care of yourself. Um, reach out to folks. Uh, um, sorry to hear that. Thank you for sharing that very personal and, and you know, difficult thing to share. And Sylvester just gave a super chat. I'm still allowed my phone in there, so I might have time to keep in touch. Well, you need to tune in, and thanks for the super chat, man. Good Lord. Um, so, wow. Wow. Patrick is here. Been busy. Uh, seeing the blatant racism towards whites just regarding Van Rebeck Day. Yeah, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. I did see the nonsense uh, attacking um, Johan Rupert. I'm going to talk about Johan Rupert and go through a list of some of the very few charitable things he does. Ah, that's a joke. We're going to talk about that. And um, yeah, so wow. Um, Sylvester, we are glad to see you back, man. Gosh, be careful. Um, wow. Thank you for the super chat, Sylvester. Look at that. Look at that, folks. Sylvester at the end of his rope and he's super chatting. That is just too kind. Thank you for that. Um, I think so, Beth. I'm not booked in yet. Okay. Well, you know, sometimes that's necessary, um, Sylvester. I mean, people need help sometimes, you know, uh, dealing with uh, folks who have bipolar issues. We, we talked about that the other day. It's, it's not something to take to, to, for people to trivialize. It's genuine. It's very difficult. Cameron's here. There's Carol. Uh, Lachlan Bird is here. Welcome to you. And then um, Idaho Garden Girl, hello, Ginger Ninja, hello, look at all the wide family farm people sliding in here, Carol and Idaho Garden Girl and Ginger Ninja, good to see you guys, welcome, and uh, everybody, so let me, I'm just going to cover Johan Rupert, this is a very nice story done by Business Tech, I appreciate when journalism goes to the effort to point out things that are not what people believe, let me see if I can find where I put this story at, because I rebooted my browser here, so... Uh, it's going to be a business tech, so that's not it. Um, hang on a second here. That's not it. Come on, it's a business tech. That's I got a business tech article here. It better not have disappeared. Or I'm not going to be happy. Let me see if that's it. That's not it. Oh, come on, man. There it is. Oh, it's not business tech. My It was my broadband. Excuse me. My broadband. So I'm going to bring this story in, folks. We're going to talk about this uh, while we wait for... While we wait for Rob, hopefully Rob will join us. Uh, I'm looking to see if he's um, he hasn't read the message yet. So here you go. Johan Rupert's incredible charity work, including giving poor communities houses and land. So Johan Rupert is the richest person in South Africa by a wide margin these days. His wealth has increased over the past several years. But Johan Rupert uh, was born into wealth, but he's turned that wealth into even more wealth through astute investments and wise management of assets. Now, Johan Rupert is a shareholder in the Richemont Group, which um, is a major luxury goods uh, producer, including um, uh, Van Cleef and Arpel, among other things. Cartier is part of their brands. And in interest of full disclosure, I'm a minor, tiny, tiny shareholder in that company through American Depository Receipts from Switzerland, where the stock is listed. And I get like 20 or $30 a year in dividends from them. So that shows you how small a shareholder I am. But uh, Richemont Group has uh, created vast wealth for many, many people and has been a positive uh, in the luxury goods sector, selling rich people luxury goods <laughs> so that other people can have jobs. Well, Johan Rupert has taken his wealth and he's done some really fabulous things with it for South Africans. The reason I mention this story, ladies and gentlemen, is because the economic freedom fighters once again decided they were going to harass a private citizen by descending on wine estates owned by Johann Rupert in the Western Cape to complain about white monopoly capital and the specter of white racism. Of course, the racists are the EFF. They are pure and simple deep in their heart, race-hustling racists who to think that people should get privilege and advantage based on their skin pigmentation, which, of course, is the very definition of racism. Well, while they were attacking Johann Rupert on Jan van Riebeck Day, it's no such day exists, but now people are calling the 6th of April that day because the colored Johann, uh, Jan van Riebeck 
hurts the feelings of racists in South Africa. So let's talk about what Johan Rupert does for South Africans. Ladies and gentlemen, this is from my broadband. Thank you for the honest report. Uh, one of South Africa's most generous businessmen, as part of his philanthropic and charity work, he's given over 2,000 title deeds to poor communities. Ladies and gentlemen, 2,000 poor South Africans own property because of Johan Rupert's direct intervention in giving it away. That's his choice. It's philanthropic. Uh, Johan Rupert is currently ranked with $9.6 billion of personal wealth on paper. Mind you, he doesn't have $9.6 billion sitting in a bank. Those are assets, and assets can decline in value like that, or they can increase in value like that. But that's $141 billion rand is his net worth. Now, his family's built wealth over decades, but uh, he's been an easy target for the left-wing losers. So the tremendous value Rupert and other successful businesses add to the country is often discounted in the attacks by hate-wanking leftists. Apart from employing thousands of people, he's been the highest individual taxpayer in South Africa for 20 years. So for 20 years, this gentleman has paid more in personal income taxes than any South African for 20 consecutive years. So first off, any argument that uh, against Johan Rupert should stop right there. He's done more to contribute to the fiscus of South Africa than any other South African. He out pays 59 million plus South Africans. That alone should be the end of the conversation, but it's not for the leftist hate wanking um, EFF members and clowns like that. So let's just continue the story and we'll cover more of what there is to say about Johan Rupert and his generosity. Rupert's large tax contributions help the South African government pay social grants, fund social development projects and invest in education. They also have, his family also has a long history of supporting South African educational institutions, educational programs, and environmental causes. His father, Anton, helped establish the South African operations of the World Wide Fund for Nature and was involved in the National Parks Trust of South Africa. Rupert and his family have also supported Nelson Mandela's Children's Fund, the South African College for Tourism, and the Ikamva Labantu. One of the projects they feel most strongly about is giving underprivileged people land and houses. They have already sponsored 2,000 title deeds in Stellenbosch and Graf Renet. Through the Kaya Lam My Home Initiative, thousands of poor people's lives are transformed by making them homeowners. Here's a few highlights. On November 21st, 2019, Johann Rupert and his wife Gaynor presented 132 full title deeds to residents from Kaya Mandi, Klapmutz, Kalmore, Franshoek, and Luru townships. On the 31st of March, 2021, 68 title deeds were presented in Tumahol Free State, sponsored by the Reddit Foundation. On the 13th of April, 2021, in Blokumbos, Kaifontaine in Western Cape, 166 titles. On the 14th of April, 2021, 175 titles for new property owners in Mokwalo in the Free State. 158 more titles put in the hands of new owners in Saldana Bay. On the 21st of April, the Rising Tide Foundation and the Renette Foundation sponsorship enabled the presentation of 222 titles in Piratona, Heilbronn, in the free, and the Free State. On the 29th, Heilbronn's in K, uh, KZM, uh, on the 29th of April, 2021, 71 titles given to the people of the Idis Valley Low Cost Housing Project. On the 5th of May, 2021, in Kwakwatsi, in the Free State, 50 titles given to poor households. The Rupert family has pledged a further 10,000 titles to its ongoing Kaya Lam initiative. Yes, and of course, he's an evil racist white person, according to the EFF, and received his wealth illegitimately. Well, he didn't, but even if he did, look what he's doing with it. How many title deeds has Silver Ramaphosa handed over to poor black and colored South Africans? How many? How many, Mr. McDonald's? How many Big Macs have you given away there, Silver Ramaphosa? You tell us. You tell us. Mm-hmm. Anthony Jenkins, love your post. Um, a bit depressed. Lost my mom a week on your stream house. Anthony Jenkins, I'm so sorry on the loss of your mother. Thank you for sharing that deeply personal situation. I'm sure the loss is deep. I don't know if you had a close relationship with your mother or not. And Rob Hutchison's coming in now. So hang on, let's get Rob in here. And um, thank you for sharing that, Anthony. I'm glad I caught that before Rob came on the program. Um, so we're going to harass Rob when he comes in since he's tardy. We're going to have a little fun with that. Mandy Dumut, uh, Lulu Innovations is back. Good to see you again. And Anthony Jenkins, our, our thoughts and concerns with you and your family. There's uh, Rob Hutchison right now. It looks like his mic might be on mute. Are you there? Are you there, Rob? Can I hear you? Hello. Rob. Oh, you yeah. are there. Okay. Rob, what we're yeah. going to do, first off, um, uh, just uh, Anthony Jenkins in the chat. Uh, Sylvester Salinas in the chat. Just not to bring you down, but Sylvester mentioned that he recently tried to take his life twice. And um, he's going into an institution to help him deal with that. That's an incredibly personal experience to share 
on on our program. So our thoughts and concerns with Sylvester and best wishes for his mental health and for his well-being. And and I told him, I said, you know, um, there's never give up. You know, come here, tell us about it. We'll we'll do our best to cheer you up. You know, do what we can. Um, life. It's never as bad as it seems. It's difficult, the situation going on. So that's the first thing. And then Anthony Jenkins just shared with us that his mother just passed away last week. It's just, uh, so we're not trying to bring people down, but um, it's deeply personal for people to share these sort of things. And, and I'm humbled that people would share such personal events of their life on a channel with Rob and I. Rob, welcome to the program. What I want to do, I don't know if you maybe want to say something and pass condolence or something. I don't know. I'll give you a chance to do that before I continue. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that, that is, it's an amazingly brave thing to do and it's incredibly correct thing to do as well. You know, I think everybody has a, has a moment in their life where they, they think, well, you know, this ended all, I can't, I can't have this. Uh, speaking from personal experience as well, so you're not alone there. Um, I've lost two brothers to, to suicide and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough thing, it really is. You know, one, one was completely unexpected and the other one was, was kind of expected. So hang in there, hang in there. Life is never that bad and there's always something good in in what you're experiencing just shift your mindset and spot the opportunities that that happen that's that's all i can say there yeah I, rob thank you that's very kind of you to share that again deeply personal information wow it's everybody i feel like dr <laughs> phil you know everybody's sharing on this program uh i, I had experience unfortunately as a young uh, young man with a suicide attempt and it was it was it was deeply impressionable on me and, and really um, had an impact on my entire life. Not, not, not a gray or miserable impact, but it, 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 it helped me realize just how fleeting life is and how important it is to make the most of it and also to, to watch out for signs. We don't always see those signs. Um, it's difficult. Sometimes we miss it. Um, the recent passing, Gareth Mason, I, it's not been announced why he died, but I have my suspicions. And, and um, that's kind of sad if, if that, in fact, was the case there. But Lori Lettinen from Finland just gave a super chat, 10 euros, and said, according to the news, um, it seems Finland will make a formal note to seek NATO membership on May 14th. Woo, if they've announced that, that gives Russia a month to harass them, five weeks to harass them to back off of that. Uh, maybe it's just political gesturing. We'll see if that's big news. Uh, now, what I want to do now real quick, Rob, is I'm going to take us off the camera and I'm going to restart with our opening so that so we can take this portion and I can just delete the other portion when I load it up on other platforms. And then because I was talking about a bunch of things, including Johan Rupert's generosity. We can talk about that, too, when we come back. But I'm going to ask you to put your mic on mute. I'm going to put mine on mute. I'm going to do the reopen. Then we're going to come back. OK, folks, we're going to restart the program now. Thanks for being with us for the last 25 minutes. You didn't waste your time. You got to listen to me and some very personal stories. But let's go ahead and we're going to restart this now with um, with about a minute, and three seconds of the new opening. Some of you just tuned in, so you missed it. This is courtesy of Kevin Nicklin. The guy is brilliant. He's been doing all the openings for my programs. This one, um, shh, don't tell anybody, but I think this is my favorite one. This is really cool. Here we go. I have to share this. Clearly, Rob's dog loves Rob. I heard Rob's dog clattering on the floor there for a moment. He must have tapped the microphone. Uh, that dog is, uh, we're going to have to see it someday because it's a clear part of the program here. <laughs> it is, absolutely. I think it's just that time of the day where she just thinks, 
don't leave me behind closed doors. I'm coming to sit right by you. Exactly. <laughs> well, as long as we don't get him howling like Ronaldo's dog, we'll be okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, Rob. Uh, so so we'll get to SABC here in just a moment, but uh, I just uh, want to correct something. Lori uh, t- mistyped. He, it's the 14th of April, so just a week. Well, that's not enough time for Russia to apply enough pressure, so maybe it's legitimate. I'll take a look into that story, and I'll probably do a video about um, the pitfall and the advantages of uh, Finland joining NATO. Uh, Finland, you know, the very term of neutral neutral state, Finlandization grew out of Finland's neutral stance since the Second World War. And this is shocking development. And um, no, it's not shocking. I mean, it's, it's, it's not surprising. If I was Finland, I would have considered this long ago. But I mean, in the scheme of geopolitical things, it's a big deal. It's not a minor issue. And Russia is not going to take kindly to it. It's the one place where there's ground borders are still open. People transit on, on border crossings by La Penranta and places like that easily between Russia and Finland. But anyway, any thoughts on that before we get on to the topics of the day? I mean, I don't know if you follow Finland at all and NATO. But no, I actually didn't. That's the first time I've heard, I've heard about it. But you're right. It's it is it is. I wouldn't say shocking, but it is definitely questionable. It's very odd. What's what's really behind it, and what do they stand to gain? It's they haven't been part of NATO for, as you say, forever. So yeah. what 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 is behind this really? I reckon we'll probably only find that out uh, once they do join. It's. Well, oh, wow. I'm actually quite taken aback by it, to be honest. Yeah. Well, for, yeah, it's not shocking as I corrected myself there, but but it is noteworthy. Mm. And it's definitely noteworthy, definitely newsworthy. And to me, the reason they're doing it is is fear of Russia. And number two, the Article 5 guarantee. Article 5 means an attack against one member of NATO, 30 member states means an attack yeah. against all. And that pretty much means the chips are in. It's not going to be like Poland in 39, all UK and France, we guarantee your independence. Yeah, right, here come the Nazis, then come the Soviets, the other side, and, and, Russia, and Poland's partition. And this, this is, the Article 5 is a real guarantee. It was only, it's only been invoked, well, it's been invoked now, but the first time it was invoked was 9-11. It had never been invoked uh, when the terrorist attacks in the U.S. took mm. place. NATO politically took the action to declare that an Article 5 situation in all NATO members. That's how come NATO got involved in Afghanistan, where they shouldn't have been. That's my view. But anyway, so there you go. Yeah. But um, uh, So uh, there was something else over here. Oh, Maryland's mother passed away in a car accident five years ago. Sorry about that, Maryland. That's a tough way to lose someone in an unexpected way, too. So, And then Leovin um, asked this question of you, Rob. Now, you couldn't hear that intro because you and I are on Zoom, and that played in this in this broadcast in the background but you did um i sent that video to you and i think you loved it wasn't that the case she wants to know your thoughts on it yeah yeah, yeah. it was, wasn't bad at all I, I quite enjoyed it it was some it's something different put yep. it put it that way and something different is always the way way to go break away from the mainstream chop and change make it your own and that certainly is it does reflect that well done yeah it's pretty cool and kevin did that so uh they get a little round of applause or a thumbs up for kevin nicklin folks i don't know if kevin's here today but make him make him embarrassed make him blush make him turn red for his efforts <laughs> but uh that's your go kevin there, there you go go kevin <laughs> all right so rob let's shift gears here um thanks everybody tuning in. you're listening to answer the question with chris white and rob hutchison the wise bros as we've been uh, nicknamed i think by paulie i think is one called us the wise bros and thanks for tuning in, folks. Of course, our totem is an elephant and uh, an owl. And we have two totems. <laughs> so uh, thank you for joining us. This is Indigenous broadcast here with totems and everything. But uh, <laughs> so, um, Rob, you just came fresh from an interview on state-run media, SABC Corporation. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. I did. They were questioning me about the uh, end of the state of, of disaster and moving the health regulation or moving the regulations to be under the health act and uh, questioning what's wrong with it which took me back by by, by surprise actually so so, so, they, hang on, so sabc was puzzled that people would be upset with it yeah yeah absolutely which can, was quite can, strange it, I mean, i'm sure that you know in the interview you probably didn't want to do this but i mean if they want to interview me i'll be happy to inform them how disconnected they are from reality <laughs> That's exactly what I try to bring across. And my, my, whole, my whole argument against them was, these are now temporary regulations, which are now being made permanent. We don't care if they reflect level one, which is not so bad and not, not uh, as bad as people think it was, and we could still move around. The point is that these regulations are now permanent or will be permanent. Yeah. And that's what we should be fighting. I don't care about what level they are. Even the president said, 
that the levels no longer matter. We've seen level 1.63 and <laughs> adjusted level 4. So the levels mean nothing at the end of the day because it's the regulations that determine the restrictions. Now, Rob, 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 I think you're confusing <laughs> levels with variants. 1.63, I think that's a variant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Maybe that was it because nobody knows how they determined the levels or how they became oh, adjusted oh. levels. Rob, you come on. You know how they science. do it. I've done this before, man. They, they go to KZN. <laughs> They consult the San Goma, they toss the bones, and there you go. That's how they come up with the level. That's how it works. <laughs> I don't even think they go that far, Chris. I think it's yeah. just like, okay, there we go. What you make them today? Oh, let's let's see. Okay. What makes it look Both. like okay, we're level what, what makes it look like we're actually doing something while we steal Correct. out the back door? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay, Correct. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Hey, Rob, uh, <laughs> look, I know you're not an accused murderer, but uh, would you like an appointment for this treasurer of the ANC in Pumalanga province? I mean, you know, you, you can in, in absentia <laughs> yes. be an accused murderer and, and win the election. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, perhaps that's what medals are actually about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember we, last week we chatted about the, the, the weird medals on, on the police commission. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> badges oh. of honor but in a different thing maybe they kill so you're like inside of an airplane or My or something goodness. who My knows no, but know. that's Crazy. a shocking shocking development but not surprising actually you know there's no. well i mean no 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 be because th this, this is the yeah. same party that endorsed a convicted pedophile child rapist jeffrey donson to become the mayor of Connellan. now Folks should know 16 mm. years ago thereabouts he raped a minor girl repeatedly as mayor was convicted Never went to jail, didn't spend a day in jail over this. Set aside by a corrupt judge, he was given, uh, you know, uh, a fine and, and nonsense, like 20,000 rand. What a joke. That doesn't restore the uh, innocence and identity and, and psyche of the, the child he raped. And now he runs again in the ANC, he supports that, along with his convicted fraudster deputy mayor who has to wear an ankle bracelet and can't leave his home. This is the angry, naughty children. This is the ANC. Sorry to interrupt you there, but I had to throw in the Jeffrey Donson. Yeah. Thing. No, you're absolutely right, and that it is really concerning because it does seem to be uh, part of, part of the recruitment process. If you if you have a long conviction record, have a long uh, a, a, not even a conviction, but if you're accused and on trial and still currently on trial, then you seem to be placed or pushed further up the up the ranks, and your your opportunities and chance of becoming a, a top ANC member seem to be pretty good, which is quite concerning. It really is. Yeah, there's there's rumors that the the ANC is nothing more than a than a criminal organization pretending to be a, a government. And they seem to be pushing that narrative themselves and reinforcing it with every move that they make. Well it's quite here, bizarre. Here's a news flash. That's not a rumor. I've been stating that for three years. <laughs> yeah. I've been using the US term Rico, racketeering. They're a racketeering operation. I mean, the list is endless. Yeah. And, and and there's officials I never even heard of. We you know, and ones we forget about, like Dlamini, the women's league leader. You know, forgot all about her mm -hmm. corruption. Now she's been convicted. By the way, uh, two people were trying to get fraudulent documents from Durko, just got fifteen years in prison, including an Ethiopian and a South African, for fraudulent documents. But but Dlamini who is already a convicted felon, and then she's in charge of the Women's League for the ANC, and now she's convicted of perjury before the court over fraud, and she's given an option of paying 200,000 Rand or four years in jail suspended. What kind of justice is that? These guys got 15 years for trying to secure fraudulent documents. That's, you know, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling here, and I've got a question from the chat. I'll give you a chance to respond to that if you want, but then I'll get the question. Yeah, no, I think that's that is exactly the problem in in South Africa is that the so-called elite seem to get away with with well, literally murder, and that it, it doesn't bode well. It, they, it's it's definitely a case of rules for thee, but not for me, and the the public have have come to realize that that is a problem, and it's I I can absolutely guarantee that it's going to lead to great societal problems because where leaders are supposed to be setting example, they certainly are setting example. And that example is that you can get away by breaking laws, you can get away with this, and you can do, do whatever you want as long as you are a friend of the ANC connected. and as long as you vote there. You're connected, yep. that's it. If you're a made man, just like the mob. <laughs> exactly. Just like, just like exactly. the mob. 
No difference whatsoever. <laughs> it's a racketeering operation, and I stand by that assessment. I mean, how can you account for uh, Zandile Gumeda, Ace Magashule, Zwele Mkizi, uh, Batabile, and, and then Dalamini, and, and just the list goes on and on. And, and these are the big names, you know, and there's lots of petty ones we never even hear about. All right, so here's a question from the chat, Rob, and it's addressed to the Wise Bros. So I'm not going to skip over this one. It's from an account I don't recognize, uh, Pain Tube Q. Interesting. I like that username. Um, so I'm going to give you a chance to answer first. I've already addressed it previously, so I want to get your response, and then I'll, I'll adjust and from there. Do you think Russia deserves freedom of speech? I think what they mean is, is should Russian media outlets have the right to – so does Russia deserve freedom of speech? And even if it is propaganda, are different views crucial to the full story? Rob, thoughts? Well, to sum it up in, in one word, yes. And uh, the reason for that is because – how do you know what is propaganda and what is not propaganda? There's no way of telling. And uh, I've said right from the beginning in, when this whole conflict started is that this is a misinformation war and an information war. And those that with whoever has the strongest source of information and the most believable information is, is going to win this war. Banning, banning an alternative view uh, might actually turn out to be banning the truth. We don't know at this stage because we really don't know what is coming from. Uh, in fact, the only people that do know what is going on is uh, Putin, Zelensky, and their respective cabinets. Those are the only people that know the truth. Everybody else, uh, other than that, we are looking at things through the lens of the media, looking at things through, we're looking at opinion, not, oh. not fact at all. And quite frankly, there's, there's an incredible amount of misinformation coming from both sides and disputable so-called facts from from both sides so we we as as the public and observers in in this conflict we we should be allowed to see both sides of the story with without a doubt who knows maybe by seeing what's coming out of out of russia and through their media we will see what's actually going on we will see uh, something in favor of ukraine we will see russians speaking out we don't know or we might see the opposite. I, I don't think there's freedom of speech in Ukraine either, come to think of it. I think they, they're very selective in what they put out. So you know, it's, it's two sides to the coin there. And uh, right now, I don't believe anything that's, that's coming out of the media in any way what, whatsoever. This is the media that we're talking about, after all. Yeah. Well, there you go. The same people censor the content. You know, the Washington Post suddenly has discovered Hunter Biden's laptop after the choosing is already over. Yeah. Suddenly it's a newsworthy story. Suddenly they admit that there's truth. Suddenly the, the laptop has been entered into evidence in congressional hearings. And already two tidbits have come out. Ron Klain, the White House chief of staff, is involved in corruption back in 2012, trying to get money for a nonprofit to keep it in nonprofit status. That's just one little tidbit. And there's even more coming out. So, you know, it's it, trusting the media. <laughs> Give me a break. If we trusted the media, Kyle Rittenhouse would be in prison, being gang raped right now. <laughs> That's exactly, exactly Honestly, correct, isn't it? If it wasn't for independent mm. journalists recording, because there weren't, there weren't CC, we're not England, we don't have CCTV cameras every three feet to intrude in your life. So it wasn't mm. for independent journalists recording the events that night to disprove the lies, the media hype. That's the same thing. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for good investigative work, the Duke lacrosse young men would have all been convicted rapists and gone to jail even though it never happened. It never happened. Yet they would have gone to jail. Exactly. And so, so you know, because the, the media frenzy, all this feeding and this nonsense going on, and it's it's every day they're proven to be frauds. And, and I'm talking about all of them, including Fox News. They're all frauds. Um, they rush yeah. to get the clicks. They rush to get the views. They don't investigate things properly. There are good journalists out there, but people don't, they don't sit around and listen to what the good journalists investigate and find out. And a fair number of them sprinkle their opinion all over. Max Boot put an op-ed piece out a couple of days ago to denigrate uh, conservatives and Republicans. And it's just, just a, it's a hit piece. And it's sad because he's actually a good author. He's written some good stuff in the past, but it just shows he's a political wonk here. It's really sad. Okay, my view on this, and I've been very clear on this from the outset, and I've been reporting the propaganda that I've determined to be propaganda from both sides since the outset. And also the propaganda, more importantly, the focus has been on the media where they've lied about stuff. The Russians have been thwarted by the valiant Ukrainians. They can't. 
No, it's a operational pause. Notice the salient here in the Northeast where there's a gap between Russian forces. It would be foolhardy to advance on Kiev when you can be attacked from three sides and, uh, and hemmed in by a river when your forces in the Northeast until you can get them advanced. Now, the Ukrainians holding off the forces in the Northeast, that in Kharkov and place like that, that's legitimate. But all this nonsense and Ukrainian propaganda, oh, the super Russian pilot who single-handedly shot down 16,000 <laughs> Russian aircraft. Never happened. The photograph they used of it was fraud. A member of the par of the cabinet in the Ukraine took a picture of a training vid uh, from from 2019 and put that in there. A pilot in a train, you know, a training event. Total fraud. People went and found it easily when it was posted on a Twitter account from three years ago. And then this nonsense about the valiant Ukrainian border guards on an isolated Black Sea island told the Russians when they were told to surrender to Futsek, and they bombed them into submission. Uh, no, they're actually prisoners of war. The Russians captured them. The island wasn't bombed. You know, they walked on. It was There was no fight whatsoever because these border guards knew that they were toast, so they just surrendered. <laughs> so, you know, and then the Russians, the same thing. You know. So uh, answering specifically Payne's, uh, Payne Tube's question about this, when people decide for us what's misinformation, what's disinformation, you should be concerned. Let me give you a perfect example of this, Rob. Yesterday, all kinds of hubbub. An American lieutenant general was with the Azov Battalion and captured by the Russians. The Russians have an American lieutenant general in their custody. See, they're supporting the Nazis. <laughs> the general in question is Lieutenant General Cloutier, who was formerly, now they list and they put a photograph up of him calling the deputy commander of Africa Command. Eh, never the deputy commander of Africa Command. He was the commander of U.S. Army Africa in Vicenza, Italy as a two-star general. So that's factually incorrect. And oh, by the way, that ended two years ago. He's been assigned to NATO for two years. He is a NATO land force component commander, which is, which is what he is. He is a lieutenant general. And he was in the Ukraine in June of 2021 for a multilateral exercise. There's photographs of him there. So they put it up and say he's been captured. Now, why would people, that this is such weak propaganda, why would that be blocked? Let RT, let Sputnik broadcast that. It took me 15 seconds to go, this is nonsense. And to send it back to people on WhatsApp when they send it to me, going, see, I'm like, now look, this is why this is nonsense. Oh, by the way, when he's supposedly in the custody of Russian forces, He's in Turkey at a conference and there's publicly available photographs and video of him being there. So, I mean, this is this is just, you know, these things are so easily refutable. And then these pictures of a, a hind being blown up by a missile head on, that's doctored video. That's a deep fake. All this stuff going on here. Uh, you know, and here's, here's the question I've had since the outset, Rob. Ask yourself, how many videos and images have you seen from Ukraine of destroyed Ukrainian BMPs, T-62s, T-72s, um, uh, M -M MTLBs? Or how, how many destroyed? I've seen two destroyed Ukrainian tanks in this entire war, but I've seen thousands of Russian destroyed tanks. Okay, wait a second. Time out. I've also seen people going, well, look, look, the Ukrainians are retreating. They're retreating. We have them on video. They're Russian BTRs and BMPs with Russian flags waving as they go through town and people are telling how stupid they think we are. And they're censoring this stuff. This is this is the stuff not being censored because it's on Twitter and social media and they allow that narrative to go on because it suits their needs. How about you let us decide? I'm so sick of it. The only Western outlet that's allowing free speech is Odyssey. If you want to watch RT Russia today, you can go to Odyssey and watch it. Now, I've watched it on Odyssey just to see and... Yeah, it's very stilted, but there's also legitimate news reporting there, and I can decide for myself what's propping in and not. And I find it very insulting when Joseph Goebbels' grandniece, Jen Psaki, tells me what's the truth, because she is an insulting uh, clown to the entire world, as is Joe Biden and their nonsense. It's just ridiculous. These people, they make up more stuff than comedians do, you know? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, I, want to, I want to decide for myself. What about you, Rob? I absolutely do want to decide for myself. And, and as it stands, I'm, I'm not allowed that opportunity. And as you correctly pointed out, this, the mere fact that RT has been uh, silenced globally means that the, the only propaganda that is coming out of that region is from the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It can only mean that. And we've seen an incredible amount of, of propaganda, fake videos. I, I even saw a footage that, that was from a, a computer game, a, a PlayStation game that was used as a legitimate uh, defense and Ukrainians uh, from, from Ukraine. And it was tweeted out by the Ukrainian president's office. Yeah. So come on, yeah, we have to question that. That is legitimate propaganda. That is pure evidence that it originated from the Ukrainian president's office. So what is really going on there? When, when we say that 
RT is putting out uh, propaganda. Well, where? If they, if they are banned everywhere else, how can they possibly putting, be putting out propaganda? It can only come from, from one source. So we have to stop and think, really, uh, what is going on here? Do we, do we really know the truth? And the only way to, to actually find out that truth is possibly go and see it for yourself. And I've, I've seen a couple of independent journalists who've done that. And that raises a whole lot of other questions. You know, one journalist pointed out that there, there are 21 million cell phone users in, in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Each one of those has a high resolution video camera. Why have we not seen any, any first hand video footage of the conflict? Can anyone explain that? Exactly. Exactly. What's that all about? What is that all about? We seem to get amateur people going in from the West who are soldiers of fortune who make videos themselves come to the country, but we're not getting anything from Ukrainians. We're not getting anything mm -hmm. in Maripol. There are still communications coming out of there. I mean, videos being recorded by RT and be recorded by others. And, you know, so yeah, there's, there's all kinds of legitimate questions here, Rob, that just, it just doesn't pass muster. You know, it's, uh, like I said, I've been calling out the media for their, their, their lies and their distortions since the beginning. And I've also been refuting these things that make no sense whatsoever. I've been very reticent to just jump on some go like like the Buka and the uh, Hosomel um, massacres or genocide, whatever people are trying to call it right now. Uh, I, I, I look, I have no doubt that there are dead people there and that evil things may have happened. But we know nothing. We don't know who's responsible. We don't know when this happened. We don't know anything. We're just listening to government officials. And we've got people like Zelensky saying that, well, you know, it's time to reform the Security Council. Really? Because Russia attacked you? Well, that's not a legitimate basis to reform the Security Council. I mean, that's just the leftist narrative. That's been the South African narrative. Well, it's time that the permanent powers don't have the permanent vote. You know what? If you don't like the UN, then leave it. Leave it. Form your own alternative body. I'm sick of this nonsense, you know? Now, I'm not justifying the five permanent, uh, you know, veto powers. I'm not justifying them. I'm just saying that's the system. If you don't like it, leave it. Create your own. I mean, look, the Chinese didn't like the IMF, so they created the BRICS Bank, you know? Hey, good for them. The World Bank, they got their own now. Good for you doesn't do anything for anybody. And they got the Asia Pacific Development Bank too. But, you know, it's just, it's just, it really, this whole thing is just this, this whole conflict is just, uh, you know, it's, Rob, it's, 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 a, it's an information war. You say, I said that early on myself. Yeah. I haven't said it for a while. So thank you for reminding mm -hmm. me of that. It's exactly what it is. It's an information war and it's an information war. And, and I know where I want to go with this. It's an information war that's going from information to xenophobic. So we yes. have people saying, don't listen to Tchaikovsky. As if a dead Russian composer from 150 years ago is going to have an impact on a war going on in Ukraine. If I want to listen to Nutcracker this week, I'm going to listen to it. Shut up. Leave me alone. If I want to, re if I want to read Mother, if I want to read the Gulag Archipelago, I'm going to read. If I want to buy the book, I'm going to buy. By the way, Sultanism is dead. Nobody's profiting from that in Russia. Grow up. Mm. And this is dangerous. So let me give you a parallel here. In the First World War. The racist Woodrow Wilson administration, who segregated the federal workforce for the first time in the, in the 20th century, first time it ever happened, mm -hmm. before that blacks and whites worked together in federal government. But Woodrow Wilson did. He also aired the first ever motion picture in the White House. That was Birth of a Nation. That was a pro-KKK, pro-lynching, white supremacist movie. That's the first movie ever showed in the White House. That, that's a stain on our character forever. That was done by Democratic president Woodrow Wilson. So Woodrow Wilson... Um, he and his administration whipped up hatred of Germans. Now, America at that time had over 40% of its population with some German ancestry. We had New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore with multiple German language newspapers that were some two centuries old. We had breweries all over the country run by ethnic Germans. Ethnic Germans were integrated in this country. You go to cemeteries and people all spoke English, but they also spoke German. Because of this xenophobic hatred of Germans and the Hun, well, the Hun is not Germans, they're freaking Mongols, but they applied it to the Germans, you know, anyway, so, and they're also not Bosch. Bosch is Danish, and they are not Danish, it's Dutch, and they called the Germans Bosch to anything to denigrate them. Because of that, Germans stopped speaking German. German singing choirs died overnight. Tens of thousands of singing choirs where Germans got together just disappeared. Singing groups, the little little marching groups for folks marching. The newspapers folded up. The breweries were sold off. And then we had Prohibition after that. That really destroyed. But, but it destroyed a huge element of German-American culture. And American culture was killed because of the xenophobia. We have a few million ethnic Russians who've come here since the end of the Cold War. And now they're being demonized. Alex, uh, Alex, what's his name? Uh, Ovechkin, who plays for the Washington Capitals, one of the best hockey players in the world, is being harangued about why he doesn't call out Vladimir Putin. Well, 
Ovechkin's family lives in Russia. Probably not a wise idea for him to call out Putin. And also, they know each other. This this xenophobic nonsense that's coming out of this from this propaganda is dangerous and unacceptable. It, it is, and it's, it's actually quite shocking. I mean, what what on earth has somebody who's lived for generations in in the U.S. Uh, as as an immigrant Russian what what have they got to do with with the war? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you're absolutely correct. It is it is pure xenophobia, and it's it's exactly the same as racism. Classifying a whole group of people uh, according to the actions of of one individual or or, or one cabinet. And that again should should raise red flags in in anyone in in the situation because it really makes no sense at all if if you really think about it. We've actually funny enough while I was on the interview early early on, they had to break break away because there's xenophobia and xenophobic uh, violence happening in deep, in deep one slew. of the townships deep in Deep yep, yeah, yep. and they actually broke away to footage there, and there again the Deep Slit is in absolute tatters because of uh who knows mis misconception about foreigners taking jobs and foreigners taking away the opportunities of of south africans what absolute rubbish yep. what absolute rubbish so one one uh, zimbabwean national was brutally murdered by by the community and really nobody knows why other than he was a zimbabwean and he happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time and mob mentality took over what is the difference between that and the xenophobia against against uh, Russians who don't live in Russia? There's no difference at the end it's of the day. No, no difference whatsoever. Really, it's, I don't understand the, the, that whole mentality. Banning Tchaikovsky. Can someone please explain that? How is, first of all, how is banning Tchaikovsky going to solve the war or the conflict in, in, in Ukraine? It's not. So <laughs> what is the point? What is, what, there is why no is uh, casting somebody out outside of the community or, or cutting them off or, or persecuting them, is that going to solve the conflict? No, it's not. So why are we doing it? Why are people doing it? It's, it's to just, whip up it hatred. It's whip up hatred, just like the atrocities that are being revealed in Buka and Hostomel, without any facts, without anything. And we saw all kinds of nonsense. Aside from Zelensky's, you know, calling for the reform of the Security Council if it doesn't do what he wants it to do, uh, we also get him calling for the International Criminal Court to do an investigation into the so-called atrocities. The International Criminal Court is not an investigative body. They're a prosecuting body. They do have a few investigators that are helpful to prepare cases, but they don't habitually go out to places and investigate crimes. That's done by the host country. That's the responsibility of the Ukraine or a third party, Human Rights Watch or somebody like that. Amnesty International come in and do that, you know, or the United Nations, although they're not unbiased. But but the point is that is that it's a third party that should be doing that because you can't trust the Ukrainians. You can't trust the Russians on this. You need a third party. And um, that's, that's just, it, but it's just, it's just absolutely crazy. Got some other comments in here from the chat. Let me bring a few of these in questions here for us. Um, Let's see. So here's one from uh, Fishes and Loaves a while ago who's into farming, lives in Florida. She said, how can um, people in South Africa store up any food for any food shortages of grain due to Russian-Ukrainian war? Becoming a concern for all, but especially for countries who import from those two countries. Um, well, I'll me, let me address that immediately and I'll give Rob a chance to get in there. So, yeah, uh, unfortunately for South Africa, they're entering fall and winter, so they won't be growing any grain right now. So so that's that's a disadvantage. That's a, the, This war comes in an inopportune time for them. Had it been in the spring, then they'd have a few months to wait for the wheat to be harvested and South Africa can grow plenty of wheat uh, by switching from maize to wheat if necessary. But um, even though only 13% of the land is arable, <laughs> that's not very much. Uh, but uh, I think this this whole food short of thing is being overblown and there's an opportunistic price gouging going on in Germany. Grocery stores have already raised the prices on things like, you know, cooking oil, even though the cooking oil isn't coming from the Ukraine. They've increased it in Aldi by 50 or 100 percent already, and they haven't even been hit by shocks. That's an anticipatory hike, and that's gouging people. Now, there are reasons for prices of food going up around the world, not the least of which is Joe Biden's, you know, tripling of the fuel of price, but blaming it on Putin, forgetting that the price of petrol in the Pennsylvania increased by 250% from the time Donald Trump left office until January this year, in just one year, during his administration because of the damage he did to confidence in the energy market. But anyway, Rob, any thoughts on that about what South Africans can do, or is it a concern of food shortages, that sort of thing? I, I don't think it's a concern at all. Yeah, we've got, we've got to look at what 
uh, what the percentage is. And I'm not sure what the percentage South Africa uh, imports or what percentage of wheat uh, South Africa imports from, from Russia. But um, I do know the percentage of uh, uh, fuel and gas that, that South Africa does. And it's about 6% from, from, from the Russian and Ukrainian region, which is nothing. Really, it is nothing in, in the bigger scheme of things. So I think it's all fear-mongering yet again. It's uh, to, to get the public uh, riled up about uh, uh, this, this Ukrainian war and blame Russia again for, for, for causing it. The, I don't believe there is any, any cause for alarm. Um, we actually, there's, <laughs> there's a good example of that. Our, our, um, uh, our minerals department and fuel department actually pushed up the prices of, of petrol it, before the, the, Russia, the conflict actually, actually broke out and then blamed the conflict for, for that, which is, which is yeah, it's a bit of an eye opener then. In South Africa, the, the price of fuel is determined by the, state. Uh, by the international, by, yeah, by the international uh, uh, price of oil. But it usually a price increase fo it follows about a month uh, after. And here the, the increase occurred as the conflict, conflict happened and they blamed that. So, Anybody who knows anything knows that it had nothing to do with that. It's simply an excuse. And you've seen the same there with, yeah. with Biden uh, blaming, blaming Russia. It has got nothing to do, to do with that. Um, no, I don't think there'll be any, any shortages. I think it's an absolute, absolute uh, fear-mongering uh, notion and nothing to worry about at the end of the day, really. There are other sources. It's a red herring. You that. know, I, I find it yeah. so interesting that here in the States, that, <coughs> excuse me, People are claiming that um, all of these disruptions in Ukraine are going to affect all of our food prices in America because you just don't know the ties. And like our automobile production is going to be done because one wire is only manufactured in Ukraine. Seriously, one wire that goes in every automobile? I'm not buying that for a heartbeat. We have 15, 20 international car manufacturers. I'm sure they all don't source one cable from Ukraine. That would be beyond foolhardy to do that. So that's another problem. But it's just this stuff is just utter nonsense. First off, in the 1980s, the Soviet Union was starving to death. I mean, we, 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 we banned the export of wheat to the Soviet Union, and they went hungry because of the, the, the invasion of Afghanistan. And we boycotted the Olympics because of that. And that gave real pain to the Soviet Union because they, they couldn't feed their population properly. The Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. Has Ukraine suddenly become that much more effective at tilling the earth and producing grain? What are their, we, it's, this is the question a real cogent thinker would ask. Okay, 1982, when they didn't have enough wheat to feed the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union had more population than, you know, than Russia has today, and Russia has fewer people than Russia had in 1990. So you take that consideration, but how much wheat did, and sunflower oil, did the Ukraine produce in 1982? What did they produce in 92? What do they produce today? How much of it's exported? These are questions people should ask. Don't just believe the media go, oh, oh, Ukraine's been invaded. There, there, there's no wheat. The world's going to starve. We are one of the world's largest producers of wheat. We exported this stuff to feed these people back in the, these commies 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It just doesn't pass the common sense test. It's utter nonsense. And they think we're fools and rubes. You know, last night on my radio program, uh, WSM, WSMN in uh, National New Hampshire, the Common Sense Conservatives, we were talking about budget. And I said, you know that 20 years ago, the federal budget was $1.8 trillion a year. Last year, it was $7.4 trillion. In 22 years, have we gotten 360% more and better government? Nope. And oh, by the way, they keep saying it's a taxing problem. We're not taxing people enough. Revenue was $2 trillion in 2000. Now it's $3.6 trillion. That's 150% more. Or not 150%, that's it's about 80% more. So you got 80% more real dollars and that's not enough? Now, you've tripled your spending but only added 80% more in income. It's it, 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 this People need to ask real questions and don't be hoodwinked by these clowns because that's what they are. Whether it's Ramaphosa, it's Biden, it's Boris Johnson, Emmanuel Macron, little juicy Trudeau or, you know, Schultz in Germany, J Mr. Ed, Jacinda Erhern, <laughs> Mr. Ed, or it's Scott Morrison. You gotta, can't trust these people. Yeah. Anyway, it's just crazy. No, no, you can't, you can't trust them at all, Chris. And that, that's, that's the thing. And what people need to start waking up again and start critical thinking. And we've, we've gone over this topic so many times, but it, it's, it's absolutely essential. And there's a reason it keeps coming up because people have lost the ability to think critically and question. We just believe everything that's out there. And I think you hit the nail on, on the head there. It's that does, does the Ukraine or does Russia produce all of our resources? And then... 
is a small little conflict gonna gonna affect that of course not absolutely of course not it's 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 ridiculous yeah, it is. Let me address a little bit more of the chat here, Rob, because we've got a very active chat group going. And actually, I think we're serving kind of as a counseling session today for some folks. So let's let's address a little <laughs> more of the chat here. But uh, before I get to that, I want to, uh, Anthony Jenkins, don't run off. I'm going to address a couple of your comments here shortly. But Dodgy Rogue said, if either of you were 30 year old South African, would you consider making a plan to leave South Africa? First off, I take offense that you think that Rob is older than 30. I'm not where you get that. I'm not sure we get that conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, but um, I, I don't know if it's a fair question because I think it, it depends entirely on circumstances. Uh, so yeah. um, I, I had never in my entire life, even though I've been to South Africa at least four to 50 times and spent a lot of time in South Africa, I have never advised anybody not to go to South Africa. I've advised them about being security conscious and, you know, not walk around with your phone in your hand and, you know, and being careful when you get in cars and how you drive, no matter where you go in South Africa. And I've advised that more frequently as things have become even worse the past three or four years. But it's difficult for me to say. I mean, if 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 I was Johann Rupert, I wouldn't leave South Africa. You know, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't leave South Africa. <laughs> if I was Rob, I wouldn't leave South Africa. Rob's got a mission to change things in South Africa. So, um, if I was a thirty-year-old in South Africa, also, it does. Am I a cadre, or am I a white Afrikaans speaking university graduate, or am I colored in the Western Cape? So, I think it's entirely comes down to individual circumstances. But I think the gist of the question from Dodgy Rogue is. Is South Africa a viable place for people to live and build a future? I think that's the question he wants to ask. And I would say that I have grave concerns. I'm not going to say it's not, but I have grave concerns. Rob, your thoughts? Yeah, no, like I, I, a 30 year old should should be traveling the world anyway to, yeah. to get experience. So if, if, I, if I was 30, I'd certainly be traveling the world opening my eyes up, opening up, expanding my consciousness, experiencing new, new, new cultures, new, new people, and seeing the world out, outside of South Africa. But at, at the end of the day, you know, no, I, I think people, people always come back to South Africa. It's a great place to, to retire. It's a beautiful country. There's no doubt about that. Sure, it has its problems, but within problems are opportunities. You know, with with especially the field uh, that uh, that I'm in, so you know, we uh, in civil society where government fails is is where civil society thrives, and that's that's great. So, the best place to be if you're a civil society operative is isn't isn't a country that's failing or a country that has a failed state. My dog agrees. So she's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's she's quite happy there. <laughs> Yeah, she's gone outside. What's what's your dog's yeah. name? Would you mind sharing your dog's name? Francesca. Francesca. Well, that's a far cry from from uh, Carter, which is uh, a Ronaldo's program. So I like that. That's Carter. much more refined, Francesca. Yeah, Francesca. That's nice. Yeah, so that's that's it. If I was 30, 30 years old, I'd, I'd be touring the world without a doubt. I don't know if I'd be emigrating, but I wouldn't be tied down to to anything at, at thirty years old. Definitely at fifty, different different story, different story. Yep. Maybe things are, are much much harder to do and you've got kids to deal with and, and so on but seriously any 30 any 30, 30 year old shouldn't be tied down anywhere you should be traveling and experiencing and then settle down where where you feel most comfortable <laughs> and i think that's great advice and you know first off thanks rob i think this is about the largest audience we've had yet for answer the question we're right at almost 100 viewers right now so thank you all for tuning in for that i'm doing my best to get to the questions from the chat we've answered some of them we'll keep addressing them so thank you folks you're listening to answer the question the wise bros with chris wyatt and rob hutchison i'm in central pennsylvania rob is an undisclosed location somewhere in south africa for safety and we're concerned about his safety. He's not in deep salute, in case you're wondering. Anyway, but uh, no, we just, <laughs> but Rob is in South Africa, and we're discussing issues relevant to South Africa, and we've gone beyond that. Talked about Russia, the Ukraine, other things, but some more things out of the uh, chat here very quickly. And the first was Anthony Jenkins said he just moved to a new province a few months back, which, you know, while we were chatting, I'm trying to see where that was. He went from Joburg to Bloemfontein. And he says the whole culture, he, it's, uh, he's, he's, I don't think he's a first language English speaker. It's just a typo because he spelled whole as in like a golf course hole, a uh, hole in the ground rather than W-H-O-L. But the whole culture is different here. Thanks for support. Well, Anthony, I can understand why you're a little frustrated. I mean, you've gone from Joburg, which, I mean, it has its distractions and its disappointments, but it's certainly a cosmopolitan area where anything can happen. You can do anything and there's lots of life going on to Bloemfontein. Now, we do have a viewer, Ron. Fundersbull, who lives in Bloemfontein, and God bless him, living in Bloemfontein. Has anyone been to Bloemfontein? Um, 
it's not exactly <laughs> a happening place. So I can understand why it seems kind of gray there in that part of the free state. But never fear, Anthony. Um, hang out with us, and we'll take care of you here and help you overcome the blahs of the free state. Uh, that's not a diss in the free state, folks. I like the free state, but uh, you got to be honest <laughs> about Bloemfontein. Not exactly the cultural center of South Africa. Uh, and then a question mm-hmm. here from John Jarvis. Um, and uh, this is good because a uh, very good question. Thank you, John. John's in the UK, a retired military person. And uh, he says, I'm a little concerned that enough comments have been made regarding the new regulations. Is Rob also concerned? Before you answer that, Rob, folks should know that there are a number of civic organizations that are taking comment, which I presume they turn over to the government. Also, people are inundating the government, hopefully listening to my advice, harassing the government to, to respond. Uh, but Rob, uh, are, are, uh, I have enough. Uh, what is enough? I mean, to me, six million wouldn't be enough, you know, but are enough comments coming in? I know that uh, I don't know the current number somebody was able to find your website i couldn't find it It was well over a hundred thousand comments a few days ago but um do you feel enough comments are coming in and are you concerned because here's my take if you give 73 million comments to ndz she's going to do what she wants is my concern um i think the only reason this backs down is if the public is in an uproar and the press jump in on it then the anc will back off i i'm not convinced although i think you have a different view and of course you're you have a stake in this you're involved in an organization that has had put pressure on the government for to change things, and you've had success. I'm a skeptic on this one because I think they want this. I really think they want this. But anyway, Rob, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, look, I I agree with you. The government definitely wants this. And the whole manner in which they've gone about introducing these regulations or shifting them to be permanent under the Health Act is is indicative of that. They definitely want this to be a permanent situation because it gives them so much power. And they can really do do whatever they want without any without any parliamentary oversight or 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 any oversight but yeah we've had i think it's sitting on about 186,000 comments now which is uh, one of our most successful campaigns to to be dead honest in such a short period of time how many did you say? How, how, how many 186,000 okay. well, that's a little bit higher than when i looked at it last <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's flying we, we we're getting an unbelievable amount but you're right. What the question is, how much is enough? And there's no answer to that question. But what I can what I can tell you is that the media have now picked it up. The media are now supporting us. I've done numerous interviews. Uh, other groups have done interviews, and the media seems to be aware of the dangers of permanent regulations, and seem to be promoting the public participation and encouraging people to have their say. And what that does is it does is it places incredible pressure on government. They they know that there'll be a public uproar. Uh, those one hundred eighty six thousand plus whatever is going through other other groups might turn into physical uh, protests and charges on on government structures. So we've always got to keep keep that that in mind. And if you have a look at the uh, the comments that people are are putting through, it's absolute anger, anger. Uh, that government has been granted these powers or wants to take these powers, and the the public are not are not standing for it. the The other positive side to uh, mass participation is that it forms an incredibly strong and stable base for a court challenge. Should the regulations, or should I say, when the regulations are are promulgated, and they they will be promulgated again, uh, I think on the sixteenth. Roma has actually in- indicated that they, they will be put in. So um, I think that's the point of, of the public participation in, in, this, in this instance. The, I don't think government expected such, a, such a, an uproar or such, uh, such public unity amongst this, this thing. But if we, go to, if we go to government and we say, right, here's half a million, half a million people who voice their opinion? They've sent it directly through to you in individual emails. They've raised their voices on on many platforms. We now representing all of those people in a uh, in a court case, in a in a in a, a proper court case to take your regulations on review, and we'll have them set aside. Government's going to stand up and, and notice that, and the court's also going to look at that and go, okay, well, you've actually got a a fantastic case here let's let's go ahead and oddly enough that's exactly what we are going to do we are um we've already briefed the legal counsel and we are going to take these regulations on on review the moment they are they are put into place 
Well, that's probably a very sound approach. Um, I'm glad that that's that's the tack that you guys are taking there because it's it's quite a frightening prospect. I think uh, what's happening here. This is, I mean, and, and the thing is that you know Ramaphosa comes on all cuddly and teddy bear like and says, "Oh, it's all gone, and we're going to just carry these things." By the way, um, multiple people reading the 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 State of Disaster Act and. In, their interpretation, there's nothing in there that gives the government the right to carry these measures over. There's things they can do yeah. ameliorate, but this, this so they're, they're violating the law right there, but they're getting away with it. Uh, but then they just want to put it in the law. But he's also failed to mention all the things that they want to put in the law. He only mentioned a couple, he didn't mention what's actually going on. If you look at what's being gasseted, they're talking about things like anyone that arrives at a port of entry can be detained by any Durko bureaucrat on presumption that they might be infected with any pathogen. So, I mean, Just if they don't pathogen. like me, if I, they don't like me and I arrive at, at OR Tambo and I'm going there to speak about, you know, something that they don't want, they know I'm coming, they just direct me over here, put me in a room, isolate me, then lock me at my expense in a, in a, in a, in a facility somewhere for two weeks on a suspicion I might have something. And that's simply, that's an oppressive measure. And people don't realize that's what's in this. And that needs to be stopped. It absolutely needs to be stopped. There's also, I'm confused about this, but some people are interpreting it and it's really confusing reading the regulations about it actually may give employers the right to mandate jabs for their employees. I don't know that that's a fact that's being bandied about, but people need to voice their opinion. And uh, six million is not enough in my view, but uh, let me get um, to a question, a comment here by George William. This is an interesting, George William says, I would rather live south of the equator than in the north with those heavily armed states like the USA, the European Union, Russia, et cetera. Uh, well, that's a generalization of the European Union. Most European Union states are freeloaders and not particularly well armed. They live off of the security <laughs> umbrella that the United States provides. Um, and he said the Cape, Namibia, New Zealand, Mauritius, Australia, the best option. Uh, well, the Western Cape is lovely, but it's also one of the murder capitals of the world. Cape Town is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. So let's be honest about that. Uh, Namibia is a lovely place, but it's mind-numbingly boring. I enjoy visiting Namibia, but living there, I mean, unless I was a hermit or, you know, Isaac Denison, you know, trying to hide out in Africa, it wouldn't be my first destination to live. New Zealand, have you been keeping up on events there, George? It's a concentration <laughs> camp. It's run by a fascist who has no regard for the rule of law, who has been propped up and promoted by a fake media around the world as the person who solved the Rona. She stopped Rona, only she never stopped it. And the measures they took locked people into hotels with armed police outside with threatening to shoot them if they dare try to exit it. Uh, the suspension of civil liberties in New Zealand is off the charts. They're, all of their measures have achieved nothing. And so New Zealand is a country with total disregard. It's also another one of these countries with self-flagellating hatred. Oh, we evil white people. We destroyed New Zealand. We took it all from the Maori. Oh, we're so terrible. Well, the Maori who came and wiped out virtually every form of life on the islands by obliterating them, beating the Moai into extinction, among others. Come on, come on. Okay, so that's 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 New Zealand. And Mauritius, <laughs> Mauritius, lovely place. Feel free to move there. But Mauritius has just put some things in, in place legally. They're questioning when it comes to investment, property ownership, and things like that. I love Mauritius. I wouldn't dissuade you from it. Uh, it's also tiny. You know, try living in Hawaii. It's nice to visit, but people get cabin fever. Eventually, you want to go a little further. And if you want to drive a little bit further, you can right into the Indian Ocean. Then you have to go somewhere else. And then Australia. Australia, are you serious? The 21st century penal colony of Australia, where Scott Morrison has suspended civil liberties, where they have taken people who are not infected with the Rona in the Northern Territories and imprisoned them in concentration camps at their own expense for three weeks, costing the people their employment. And they don't care. 600,000 people show up week after week in demonstrations in Melbourne, a city of just 5 million. 600,000 people protesting the criminal suspension of Australia rights and liberties. The last place I ever want to live is Australia. I loved Australia. I had no idea that these people had such fascism in their hearts. This is also a country that disarmed their citizens. They took away their weapons. And now the government does what it wants because the greatest threat to liberty and freedom in Australia is not the Ronin, it's Canberra. It's the Australian government. And a super chat came in. Oh, by the way, I should do a programming announcement there before we go any further. Um, and I'll, then I'll get the super chat. Uh, I should mention a uh, programming announcement, folks. Uh, I am Sky. Rob, I don't know if you know that. I'm Sky. So, <laughs> do, you, do you know that whole thing? 
No, no, don't. You need oh, okay. to educate me. Okay. Well, the, okay. Uh, Amy, who's in the chat, I haven't seen in a while. Amy, Amy's life was turned upside down. She was harassed by a bunch right. of hate wanking right. leftists because they yes. they falsely claimed that she was Sky, which was a, um, a anonymous account by a South African. Turns out it was Joe Emilio's right. wife. Yes. And they utterly destroyed her life, yes. cost her her employment. She lost her job fraudulently, and I hope mm. that she's got lawyers that can sue them because their, their, their dismissal wasn't legitimate, unless they came out with some other bogus stuff we don't know about uh, that's harder to prove, disprove. But her entire life was turned upside down. They took pictures of her, her child and all kinds of stuff. They, they destroyed her mm. life, and they have no remorse for whatsoever. So um, just before it was revealed who Sky was, um, I said on somebody's program, I was actually in a private chat session. I said, I'm Sky, and everybody started saying, I'm Sky. And then uh, it kind of called, on. I did it on Ronaldo's program, and he did it, and so, so – uh, every now and then when I see Amy, I say, I'm Sky, because Amy is not Sky, and she was mistreated <laughs> by by the, the leftist hordes who are just terrible. Amy just gave a super chat of 100 Rand. Thank you for that, Amy. How can we support you, Rob, other than sharing the stuff on Twitter and signing in? Uh, I don't know if um, DRSA does fundraising or if you get support from uh, from NGOs or whatever. H how can people support uh, DRSA, Rob? It's a good question. Thank you for the super chat. Oh, sure. That, I think the best support is, is your participation. Encourage, encourage others to, to have their say. Encourage people to continually have the say and, and uh, participate in the many campaigns that, that we have on, on a regular basis. We, we always have at least about five or six active campaigns at any given moment. And we've completed almost 300 campaigns in the past uh, three and a half years. So... Uh, your, your support, most valuable support, is your active participation, regular participation. That's about it. You can give, you can donate if, if you want. There is a facility there, but we, I value uh, your your participation more than any anything else. It really, it really does make a difference. And thanks for the offer of of support. Yeah, oh, that's that's awesome. <laughs> that's okay, really cool. first, Rob, I got to say this: it's it's refreshing to see an NGO not asking for money. And telling people that we want you to contribute by by you know uh, giving your comments that that that's awesome. Second, I'd like to say, folks, if you're so inclined to give money, uh, the super chat button is available on this channel. Feel free to <laughs> super chat your hearts out if if you can afford it. Please, if you are of limited financial means because of oppressive oppressive um, national coronavirus command council decisions from an unelected, unaccountable, capricious, undemocratic body. Please don't give any money. Uh, your participation here is more valued. I'm joking about the money, but thank you all for the super chats who've given it there. It's lovely. Um, I, I do want to say Mandy Demoe said that um, she said that uh, no, 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 Pachostrom, no, no, Hermanus is far too big for her. Uh, well, Mandy, if if Hermanus is too big a town for you, then I think maybe Namibia might be a nice spot for you to move to. I can recommend Luteritz. Nobody will come bother you in Luteritz. <laughs> Even the criminals don't make the journey to Luteritz. It's just too far away. Anyway, so Leovin just gave a super chat of 140 Rand. That's her magic number. Thank you for that, Leovin. Uh, let me get down here. Uh, where's it at? Doesn't, it's not showing. Oh, there it is. Uh, okay, Chris, you ask. Oh, okay, she gave 140 Rand because I asked. All right, folks, it's time. Roll out the... No. <laughs> 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 All right, I got I, I got a hundred rand for my Amy. I got hundred forty for Leo. Can I get 150, 160, 20? Can I? Uh, can okay. here we go? <laughs> it's an auction. What, what time. are we auctioning, Chris? What are we uh, auctioning? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. A hug from Rob and Chris. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. A post I'm Rona. Expecting. A post Rona hug. <laughs> I'm expecting clothing to come off any second now. <laughs> I'll tell you what. No, 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 no. If, if, if we raise a certain amount, Chris, Chris will shave his beard. Ah, uh, no, no, that's been tried before. That's not so I uh, must make at least one journey to South Africa so I can make the Durko officials wet their nappies when I come into the airport because you know they're going to be terrified. It's, <laughs> it's Delaray. <laughs> it's Delaray's ghost. Here, here he comes. <laughs> so, sir, what's your name? Uh, Cous Delaray. They call me <laughs> the Lion from the West Transvaal. <laughs> the Leon from the West Transvaal. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly we'd be German. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and oh, Mr. B just gave 140 Rand super chat. There you go. Okay. Well, sometimes uh, that's what it takes. Competition. Anyway, but no, but seriously. All right. So let's get, let's get back to seriousness here. We got to stop with this jovial, jovial, jovial behavior. But um, but no, George yes, William, yes. I appreciate. Um, I do appreciate uh, your comment and your concerns about things. But but listen, here's the thing. I want to say to answer that question, address it back to that point about if you're a 30 year old, you know, would you leave South Africa? Folks, giving up your homeland is difficult. 
it's even difficult in the 21st century when you can get on a plane and fly back at almost any time. You can get on a cell phone. You can do you can do a you know um, what's what's the thing uh, FaceTime with with uh, Apple. You can do a you know a WhatsApp. You can do a Telegram. You can be face to face with people like that. You can use Zoom. You can use you can use WebEx. All these things, and you have immediate you know, information about home, you can get images, you've got all, all of that makes it easier. It's still incredibly difficult. People move abroad and think they can take their culture with them. You can, but only to a degree. Talk to Afrikaans speaking white South Africans who've moved to Australia and New Zealand. Many have buyer's remorse, particularly now in Australia, <laughs> but, uh, but many have buyer's remorse because you can move there, but you may be an Afrikaner. Your kids might still be an Afrikaner. But your grandkids won't be Afrikaners. They'll be Kiwis. They'll be Aussies. And they'll have those funny accents. And they'll have the values of those lands. Now, you might contribute to the kaleidoscope of that culture there. That happens. That's what happened in America. And that's why you have kindergarten. That's why you have cotillion and all these things that people have contributed to our culture. But you'll no longer be who you were. If your identity is important to you, you have to consider that when you move. Whether you're Kosa or you're Zulu, you're Venda, you're an Afrikaner. You have to consider that because that will be gone by your grandchildren if that's important to you. And that's a reason why there will always be Afrikaans speaking white South Africans. They'll always be there. Now, how large a group they'll be may be a question, but they'll always be there because they're African. They're not going anywhere. They're Africa. They're of Africa. They're part of Africa. And that's who they are and that's who they identify as. And while some Afrikaners may move abroad because of crime, because of financial circumstances because maybe relatives have moved. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Afrikaners did this before. The Boers left, large numbers left, went to Argentina after the Second Boer War. Others went to Kenya. Uh, it did happen. Uh, but, you know, when you move abroad, it's difficult. I would never renounce or give up my American citizenship. I might live abroad. I've lived all over the world. But I'm always an American and I'll always come back to America. It's good and it's bad. And I think for a lot of South Africans, it's the same way. Thoughts there on that, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. I think I could summarize that up in 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 a in a few few in fact a few words in one sentence. Home home is where your accent is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if you if you were a person who loses your accent really easily, well then you you don't really have a, a strong roots, do you? But like, like yourself, you've lived all over the world, but you still have a strong American accent. I know South Africans who've lived uh, all over the world as well. South Africans, oddly enough tend to lose their accents pretty quickly. And you have to ask, also question why. Um, but foreigners who live in South Africa retain retain their accents. So mm -hmm. it's, it's quite a quite an interesting op observation. But yeah, you know, the, the older you get, the, the more difficult it is to, to move around because you, your outlook in life changes and your priorities also shift. So if you want to emigrate or, or move to a different country and stay there permanently, the younger you do it, the better. Yeah. The younger yeah. you do it, the better. The Absolutely. Better well, it, it gets harder too because you get into your, your 30. Oops, I think that Francesca knocked something over. Now, you get into your 30s, you get in your 40s, you typically are established. You, you've got a spouse and maybe kids and you own property or you're, you know, you've, you've, you're tied and you've got a career and you want advancement. Uh, except for global elites who easily shift from corporation to corporation and country to country, most people, it's not such a simple task. Now, I'm not trying to discourage anybody, just trying to say, now we got two super chats that came in real quick. I want to address before, before they get away because we're going to keep that super chat revenue. You know, that tap is open. We don't want to shut it off now. <laughs> but uh, uh, John Jarvis said, hi, just for clarity, I've lived in South Africa since 1995 and I have no intention going back to UK. Well, my apologies, John. I, uh, I have always been under the misapprehension that uh, you actually live in the UK. You're from the UK. I didn't, didn't realize that. So my apologies and thanks for the 140 super 140 rand super chat to correct the record and correct me. If anyone else wants to correct me, feel free to use a super chat if I've said something. <laughs> <laughs> 140, 140 is the going right. So uh, it's apparently that's the rate for a correction. They correct the record. Uh, that's a lot easier than getting the Washington Post to publish a correction to the record. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm Clothing just gave 140 rand too. Thank you for that, Mal Malcolm. And uh, Erica asked if she had to pay for hugs. No, you don't have to pay for hugs, Erica. Once again, if people don't have the means, you know, you know, it's uh, it's it's uh, you can get a hug from Rob. Um, yeah, yeah. But you know, Erica, yeah, sure. you tend okay. to catch the Rona a lot, so it might be a long distance hug. You know, we might just reach out like this. You know, you're like you're like a <laughs> you're like a mecca for the Rona, Erica. You've had what 36 times now, I think you've had the Rona. Anyway, no, I'm just teasing her. She's had a couple of times and. <laughs> She's just like a trooper. She drives right on past it. It's not an issue for her. Hester Kotze says, I was born here and I'll die here. And Keith Norkey just showed up in the stream. Um, 
What's this? Um, what's this? Carol says, I take offense, but I hear a tiny bit of PA. Uh, he does not call me Carol, which is very much the PA accent. Well, I say Carol. Uh, and, oh, Amy's oh. come back with another super chat. Coffee with Rob. Hey. 140, 141 Rand. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. There we you go. broke there the you barrier. Go. Not 200, but oh. 141. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have coffee with Amy. Put it that way. And there's oh, someone else. There you go. It's higher. Do I hear 142? <laughs> wow. Okay. Now, now we're auctioning off coffee with Rob. All right. And you know what? This might be an apropos time because, you know, you never know. SABC might rock up when you're in Mug and Bean having a coffee to interview Rob. You might wind up on SABC. There we go. There we go. I'm being dead serious. I'm being dead serious. Okay. Well, he's serious. serious. All right. He's serious. Yeah. Coffee with Rob. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. There you go. So Coffee with Rob, um, Amy started. <laughs> if anybody wants to bid on Coffee with Rob, we're at 141 Rand. And uh, whoever uh, gets to the top Coffee with Rob super chat at the end of this will get a free Coffee with Rob. All right. And I'll pay for the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> With the 140 rand super chat, yes. <laughs> well, it'll take probably two super chats to pay for the coffee, but it's close enough. <laughs> Brilliant. No. Brilliant. So there you go. Oh, um, yeah, that's awesome. Now, Anthony Jenkins, who is kind of bummed out, is laughing his bum off now. He's got some little emojis in there. So see, there you go. And George <laughs> says, I'm a Cape Tonian. I will never leave or capitulate if it comes to that. I'm just saying anywhere south of the equator is better option for the future because the superpowers up north are going crazy. Well, listen, George, I can't disagree with you when you say the superpowers are going wacko. They are definitely off the reservation. And I'm not talking about Native American reservations. I'm talking about, um, you know, military reservations. It's definitely between Joe Biden and Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz and Boris Johnson. I still think Boris Johnson is mentally unstable. When he got the Rona, his, his judgment seemed to have gone out the window since then. He has stopped being a Tory and has done his best to pretend he's a Labour Party member. And Leo Vignazza von Rendsburg just topped the 141 with 142. Amy and I will have coffee with Rob, but I don't think he will be the same afterwards. Whoa! Whoa! Okay. Challenge extended! <laughs> And there's the super chat for me. <laughs> I'm intrigued. I'm absolutely intrigued. <laughs> I, I am too. You know, we're going to have to get a camera on the ground. If this is before I get to South Africa, we're going to have to get a camera on the ground and record this and see what transpires there. Now, I'm feeling we'll, kind we'll of... Do it. We'll do a live a live broadcast of of the Wise Bros from from there. How about oh, that? Oh no, no, we will definitely do a. I mean, when, when I get to South Africa, we'll definitely do one of those too for sure. And then the Pet Zoo film crew, who seems rather sparse lately, has promised to do a film of a movie with me in Cape Town. So we're going to do that as well. Oh, wow. So yeah, yeah, no, um, fantastic. I just got to figure out you know how to do things here. I think what I'm probably going to wind up doing is that um, I'm not going to rent a car and take it all over the country. I think what I'll do is rent mm -hmm. a car locally. Like in Hautang, I'll get a car for when I'm in Hautang to get around. I'll fly to Cape Town. I'll get a car when I'm in Cape Town. Then I'll, I'll probably fly to the airport where like six people a year go to, Port Elizabeth, you know, that airport. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if I can get a rental car in Port Elizabeth because the, 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 the volume of traffic probably doesn't warrant having a rental car agency there. But I'm just no, saying. No, and, then, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm, I'm still torn because I've never been to the Eastern Cape. And I've thought about driving because there's some spectacular scenery in the Eastern Cape, driving through the Eastern Cape and then going up to uh, – to Queenie or Durban. Uh, of course, I've been there many, many times, but uh, there's a lot of people who follow my program for the past couple of years that would like to link up with me. And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, oh. I'm debating about how I'm going to do it. But of course, there's, there's, there's no doubt that I will clearly be in Cape Town in Hauteng. That's, there's no question about that. Uh, and hopefully time this with rugby. Uh, we've got the uh, Sevens World Cup coming up in September. So that's definitely on the table, but we'll see. Um, traveling internationally is a bear. And if the ANC gets its way and puts regulations in place, Rob, then um, mm -hmm. I could be detained at the airport and miss the entire tournament because some Durko turd thinks I might have influenza. <laughs> well, well, let's make let's make sure that doesn't happen. So the more people that participate, the, the stronger our court case will be, and then we can make sure that, that Chris Wyatt has an opportunity to to tour uh, the Eastern Cape. Now I think that's going to be on a new campaign banner. They'll open up my passport and go, De la <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I can get one of those passports from my Nigerian friends, okay? <laughs> of, course, of course, of course. You have Nigerian friends? <laughs> oh, of course, of course. I have. I know lots of Nigerian princes. I get emails every week from them. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Oh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's just too funny. So yeah, people are people are having a good time in the chat. Now, we're talking about very serious issues today. And folks, I, I hope we've, made, we've done a good job answering your questions. We certainly tried. But let me, let me go back to the SABC thing there real quick, uh, Rob. Mm. Uh, it's mm. great to see that they actually want to interview but like like you said it's almost like you had to educate them that it's a bad thing the government wants to do this they, they seem surprised by it which now 
you can answer this if you want, but you're not you're not you're not compelled to answer. It. But my, my supposition would be that these journalists really are clueless. They they, they really were surprised that, that that you actually would be opposed to it, and and that it really shows to me how sheltered or disconnected they are from what's happening in South Africa. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Uh, like I said, I've done several interviews, and that was the first one that actually uh, seemed to be supporting the the shift in regulations. But there again. There again, I, I look at it as maybe from a, from a different light, maybe it's just the optimist in me, is that perhaps she, she did it deliberately so that she could get that uh, point of view out into the, into the general public, which is maybe a good thing. Maybe she's a, a, a closet supporter, but is not allowed to, but she posed the question expecting me to, to present uh, the, the, the truth and the dangers out, out there. So I, I, thank, uh, I thank her for that for that opportunity. The name was Francis on, on SABC. Uh, thank you, Francis, for, for that opportunity for me to actually put out the, the truth and uh, destroy your question. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, oh, it was, it nice. was great. I believe. Well, you know, Absolutely. Rob, that's, it's interesting because on my news reports, you know, uh, some people uh, accuse me of, of, you know, not bringing certain news sites in, and, and that's because they don't watch every news broadcast. Like I was earlier this year, uh, how come you never use The Guardian? I have used 358 articles from The Guardian in the last 12, rolling 12 months. I know because every time I go to The Guardian, like, you've reviewed 358 articles this year. Would you like to contribute to The Guardian? When you stop telling lies, I'll consider doing it. But anyway, you know, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I tend to pull most mostly left-leaning news sources so I can go through it and report what they report and then, you know, just tear it apart. Like kind of like with Francis there, you know, she asked you a question, which gave you an opportunity to just destroy, you know, the premise that was coming there, which I, I relish that. I like that. When someone asks me a question that I think they're either ill-informed or I know they're ill-informed and then they've got a specific opinion on it, feel free to ask that question. It gives me an opportunity to break it apart mm -hmm. and just tell the audience what's really going on. I, I cherish those moments. They're pretty cool. Exactly. Exactly, Chris. Now, doesn't that, that tie right back to one of the first questions that, 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 that surfaced in, in, in our chat about silencing the Russian media. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly the same. Exactly. No. See, see, if you let yeah. the Russians come on as propaganda, I'll tear it apart. I'll tell you what's propaganda. I'll tell you what's propaganda. I will sort that out in a heartbeat. This is for Anne Marie Nell. She's uh, her membership, 10 months. No, oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I, 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 thank you for that, Emery. Now, uh, Emery, uh, there's two million rand for a coffee for both of you. Yeah, only you didn't put any super chat money there. So, <laughs> <laughs> two million rand sounds like a bee -E tender for a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, it does. It does. It, it, it's gonna. It's gonna arrive in a brown paper bag. We know ah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it'll be delivered by a blue light escort with a BMW. Um, <laughs> there was uh, a name I hadn't seen here before. Um, where'd she go? Where'd she go? Uh, come on. That, there's uh, Isabella Thompson says, uh, not Thompson, not Thompson, no P there. Thompson says, how's it, gents? Uh, it's been lovely listening to two of you. Cheers. Well, thank you, Isabella. I hope she didn't leave, but thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate it. Oh, she's saying hi to Erica, so I think she's still here. And and uh, Amy Justine LaRue says, coffee with Chris. Um, and then I think Erica said, Chris doesn't drink coffee. So Amy pointed out they're drinking Starbucks, but this is mostly sugar and caffeine. There's not much coffee in here. So I, I, I can be enticed into a cappuccino as long as you give me 75 grams of sugar to pour into it <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll lead on to a secret there as well i don't drink coffee either <laughs> ah. well well you know that what I tell, water. <laughs> you know what i tell people you know coffee is an evil substance invented by satan to enslave mankind and people chuckle that and some coffee drinks like what what are you talking about what are you talking about willis well look at the people who are dependent on their caffeine in the morning and they get up and don't drink their coffee Whoa. it's like watching yeah. it's watching like what, what's that show from that movie from the 70s there uh, Carrie, woo, no, <laughs> the exorcist, yeah, exactly. no, no, yeah. no, 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 <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not a human until I've had my caffeine fix in the morning. Yeah, that's so, so, a lot of drug addicts say the same thing, don't they? <laughs> uh -huh, exactly, exactly. You know, no, Helene, nothing uh, wrong with caffeine. I, I love the smell of coffee. Oh. I really do. But uh, I'm super sensitive to um, stimulants. So ah. caffeine, I, I, I literally hallucinate it if I drink one of those energy drinks, those monster energies, or oh yeah, yeah. I, I, have, a, I have about Red this Bull? much. And, oh, I can't touch it. Bouncing Absolutely off the walls, can't huh? touch it. Yeah, yeah. No, Bouncing I, off the walls. I see things. I hear things. No, it's it's a cheap <laughs> day. <I'm being> chased. <laughs> They're here for me. Black helicopters. Yeah, 
<laughs> Those black helicopters again. Yes. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, Rob, because the, the Pennsylvania Air National Guard flies from Harrisburg and they tend to fly a route over my house frequently. Sometimes they're very low and it sounds like black helicopters are coming for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Not many yeah. people know that black helicopters reference, oddly enough. Yeah. yeah, well, it was a big deal 15 or 20 years ago, but it's kind of disappeared, folks. So uh, Helene Henstock said, uh, Wimpy Cappuccino is the best. Uh, I would not know, Helene. Uh, I find Wimpy to be a repulsive restaurant. I, just, I know it's going to offend some South Africans. I cannot, I cannot eat at Steers and I cannot eat at Wimpy. The, the food in those two places mm -mm, just doesn't do it for me. I've tried. I've re tried repeatedly. I, 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 I even plug my nose and I've done everything. I, I can't eat the food. Wimpy's French fries is about the only thing I can stomach there. And their milkshakes are okay. But, but I've never had a coffee at Wimpy. That's for darn sure. So, yep. Now, mug and bean. Oh, I can deal with mug and bean. I like mug and bean. So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway so yeah uh what's this red bull red bull yeah red bull is oof, man that stuff is it's got that um what's that stuff t t it begins with a t or something like that that's not taurine taurine yeah yeah that stuff is apparently mm -hmm. not good for you but uh red bull man the Mattischitz, the austrian guy is a multi-billionaire over creating that train yeah. back in the 80s he's made so much money off that and then sprung a whole global industry off of it um but red bull it definitely um that's definitely a club drink people love that stuff at least they did in the clubs i haven't been to clubs in a long time but they love that stuff back in the day so anyway mm -hmm. well rob um Let's see. Um, what, what's coming up now? The 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 closing window. The date because it's the fifteenth of, of April. So we've got like another yes. eight days to get your comments in. Yes, yeah, yeah. So it does close on the fifteenth. Although uh, President Rambo Pause did say the sixteenth. So we'll we'll go he by what he did say by, that. By That's why said. I was confused. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he did. Which was also confusing for us because they gave 30, 30 days to comment, and that was the fifteenth to the fifteenth. But anyway, if he if he says the sixteenth, we'll we'll take the extra twenty four hours with pleasure. So yes, we need to get those comments up, um, and I, I must say that, that, like I said earlier early on, it's it's the most energetic campaign and, and quickest growing campaign we've ever run, and. Oh, it, it's stunning. We had to upgrade all of our, our systems, hardware, and everything else to handle it. And well, it's it's performing performing absolutely great. And uh, I think it's a great show of, of unity amongst South Africans. We've mm -hmm. seen all different groups coming together. We've seen religious groups come together, uh, different dominations, different uh, religious re uh, groups completely uh, supporting it. And people who we didn't actually think would support it have now actually stood up and, and had their had their say and you know, encouraging their their followers to to do the same. It's it's really, really wonderful. It's I saw somebody made a comment that the Great Reset has now become the Great Awakening. Mm. And I think this is the a great show out of that. And it's we've had a lot of I'd say pushback from from people who are, are pro uh, pro the vaccine and pro mandatory vaccinations and so on. Mm -hmm. But within that within that same crowd, we've had a lot of people uh, questioning why this is permanent. So it's great to see that that the the focus is now shifted away from should there be a, a vaccine mandates and should there be that to hang on a second, we can't have permanent measures in place for a temporary uh, disaster or temporary pandemic, and. I think the most important thing there in, in that regulations is that anything can be declared by the minister yeah. as a pandemic. Absolutely anything. Well, frank, so if it's a fr bad frankly, cold season, HIV yeah. and tuberculosis are a pandemic in South Africa. Why don't you correct. shut down the country for that? Correct, correct. So they, that, that, that's an excellent point because they definitely do take more lives than, than COVID ever has. So, and, and, and the impact is far greater. I mean, when, when someone dies yeah. from HIV, that person is gone, but the entire, it's a week long funeral. People disappear, huge extended families from work, productivity stops, not to mention the loss of human capital for the loss of that life and the agony or the amount of care that may have been spent, expensive care, taking care of that person in their dying days. It's, you know, and it's, South Africa has the largest number of people who have HIV on the planet. Nearly 7 million people or over 7 million people with HIV in South Africa out of 59 million people. And tuberculosis, over 600,000 South Africans have tuberculosis. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. It absolutely is. If you look at the historic figures on yeah. on uh, uh, HIV deaths, they're right, right at the beginning in, in, in the late 80s and, and, and nine, early 90s. Um, well, though, we don't really know much about the 80s because there weren't really facts around there. Yeah. But 
the, the the deaths, the annual deaths were around about. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Chris, but it was about six hundred thousand. I, I don't recall the figure, HIV. but it was it was pretty high. It was pretty high. I thought it was a bit lower than that, but whatever the case is, it was definitely six figures, and it was and it was it was horrific. And then, of course, in the midst of this, mm. we get you know fragile ego Tabo and Becky, you know, trying to tell us that you know his his lunatic health minister, alcoholic, raging alcoholic. You know, who get a free liver jump in the line, even though she's a abusing alcohol, you know, Soviet trained doctor beetroot. What a clown that was. Remember that nonsense? <laughs> and Tabo and Becky, you know, his fragile eagle. Well, stop telling black men they shouldn't have sex. No one said that, doofus. No one said that. Listen to what people are saying. We're telling you that cultural practices are contributing to the widespread of this virus because of the nature of it. No one's attacking the sexual mores of black Africans. First off, if you know, we got a super chat from Mr. B. 35 Rand says ANC is the only pandemic we, we have here. No, they're, they're a virus. The ANC is a virus. Uh, Mr. B, 35 <laughs> Rand great. is not going to get you coffee with Rob. We're at 142 Rand for coffee with Rob. So just want to mention that very quickly. But thank you for the super chat. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but <laughs> it's, it's, look, it's, uh, I got, I got, I lost track there, but, um, it's, 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 so Tabo and Becky, that's what's Tabo and Becky's fragile little ego, you know, acting as if, you know, it was some sort of slight against black men. The bottom line is this, we know those who study HIV and those who study epidemiology and study healthcare, which I am one of those people and deeply involved in those programs for over two decades in Africa. The, and, and, and I knew this before those two decades because I was a researcher studying it before I got involved in it directly. We know that on average, black African men in South Africa have the same number of average sexual partners as Anglo-Saxon South Africans or Northern Europeans over their lifetime. The difference is this, and this is what contributes to the spread of HIV rapidly. In South Africa, it is quite common to have multiple concurrent partners. Now, you can look at that any way you want. You can say it's a moral shortcoming. You can say, what, I'm, not, I'm not making any moral judgments. If you've got a wife and a small house, if you know that term in Southern Africa, that's an informal relationship with a second partner. And then you're sleeping with two people at the same time. Not at the same moment, obviously. It's not a menage a trois, but you get my point. You're, you're having sexual relations <laughs> with two people and you can spread it to those two people. And if one of them becomes pregnant or is nursing, you know, then it spreads to another generation. And that's one of the contributing factors. The difference is that doesn't mean that white guys don't have something on the side. Plenty of white guys do that too. I'm not, but generally speaking, the numbers are very much in the favor of the small house cultural aspect and that is africa wide and don't try to tell me it's not i lived all over the continent not you rob i'm talking about the audience i've lived all over africa there is a different term for it everywhere in west africa in franco from west africa it's called the deuxième bureau which is of course the second office if you get that reference that that's do uh, do fold it, it's a double because it's a reference to your smaller office where you go which is where that second partner is and in the in military system and government gendarmerie and police the deuxième bureau is the intelligence so that's the secret place. So, so it has a dual full <laughs> meaning. Anyway, and, and in Uganda, it has yet oh. another name. So this is what contributed to plus a long distance, long haul trucking from the DRC to Durban, from Zambia to Durban, through Zimbabwe, through Brightbridge, all, all of this stuff through Kazangulu and Botswana, all of that contributed to it. And Tom and Becky's fragile little ego couldn't deal with that. He called it an assault on black men. It wasn't. Grow up, you pathetic little sad troll of a man. And that's my thoughts on Tom and Becky. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Top and Becky, yeah. yeah, he had some good points and he had some absolutely bad points. Something yeah, no, he had. He, you know, he didn't look. Tom and Becky, I'm not trying to say he was totally useless. He was a technocrat, and and a number of things were actually achieved. And none of this nonsense of destroying a South Africa and tearing it apart, most of that didn't exist when Tom and Becky's president. That all came when Zuma came in office. And I'm not saying it's because of Zuma; it's because of the ANC, largely, not exclusively, but largely because of the ANC. I mean, we have the EFF, courtesy of the ANC's failures, and the EFF. We all know who they are, and we have all the e the racist legislation has been put in most of it in the last 15 years. Very little was put in from 95 to 2005. It all came after that for the most part. Anyway, so yeah, uh, Tabo and Becky accomplished some things, uh, but I just don't like the guy, and he wasn't the greatest president, you know, not even by a remote stretch. You know, he was, he was he, well, maybe maybe he was the best post-apartheid president for South Africa. Although Montlande, mm -hmm. I think, was the best because mm -hmm. he was in for such a short period of time, he really couldn't screw up anything. 
<laughs> <laughs> I think that's a general consensus on that one as well. Yeah, absolutely. He's also the most effective, oddly enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think he was the best one. It was such a short period of time. So little to judge him on. That's probably best when it comes to ANT. So little to judge someone on. I mean, by contrast, yeah. we have 50 years of public service or public, you know, teat suckling from Joe Biden to look at. And there's not much to be crowing about on that side of the aisle. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Rob, Absolutely. going forward from here, okay, going forward from here, the 15th, the comments close. Uh, people can support DRSA by going to the website. If you want to contribute, to donate, that's fine. Um, it, 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 there's no need for that. But if, if you have the means and you'd like to help, you can do that to help the organization. But I would also recommend people take a look at the other campaigns that DRSA has and, and other civic groups and see what people are doing on your behalf to represent you to government, to take your tens and hundreds of thousands of voices and cram all that in with one approach to the government. Because, you know, 800,000 people can't descend on parliament. Although that would be pretty cool to see. <laughs> oh, that would be absolutely amazing to see. That would be, be cool. absolutely wonderful. But I don't think South Africans have, have got that in them. They don't. So they don't, no. So what, what our platform does is it, it offers them an opportunity to do that, but from the comfort of your armchair. So you can become a truly effective, uh, what, what do we call it? Armchair, armchair active. Arm, armchair armchair activist. activist, that's it. Yeah, keyboard warrior, that's armchair it. activist. That's, that's yeah. yeah there exactly. You go. So the, we can, you can do that. And the beauty of, of uh, our, our platform is that it gives you a, a really legal opportunity to influence um, the policy before it's actually in, in, uh, implemented. So I'm getting my getting all my worms mixed up here. <laughs> so sorry, sorry, Chris. Right. Yes, it, our platform our platform gives you an opportunity to to uh, influence laws before they are enacted. Most most cases and most civil society organisations challenge challenge implementation of law and challenge laws after they've they've actually been uh, signed in and promulgated by the president. And it's very rarely successful because the there's such a long participation process. There's many interaction points and many opportunities for the public to have their say uh, during that uh, policy formation process. Yet, uh, you know, we aren't actually made even aware of, of these processes. So all we do is we, we scan the government gazettes every Friday. We find a policy that's about to be amended or policy that's about to be introduced, put it out there for public, invite them to comment, and we send those through to the to the to the government in the hopes that we can actually amend these laws before before they're done. It saves a lot of money at the end of the day because we don't have to go to court. But every now and then we do have to go to court because government ignores the public participation. And then luckily we have evidence of that and can actually challenge it in court. But we can only have that evidence if people actually do have their say. So Mr. B just gave a 350 Rand super chat saying coffee with Woo. Rob, Chris, you're paying. All right. I'm going to make a unilateral decision here, Rob, and I'm going to enforce this on you since we're co host on this program. Uh, what we're going to do is everyone who's given a super chat at the risk of cutting off future super chats, everyone who's given a super chat um, is welcome to coffee with Rob and the top super chatter gets a private few moments with Rob ahead of the coffee. <laughs> So Mr. Mr. Chris B gets speaking it. on my behalf. Yeah, so so <laughs> Mr. B gets it. Well, Rob, you offered to do the coffee, man. So so why not why not have a group of people show up? It'd be a great chance to talk about uh, DRSA and get people involved. So uh, we'll have to sort out where that might be because people live in different parts of the country. But uh, we'll set something up, Rob. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. I'd actually I'd actually love to do it. It would be it would be actually wonderful. Uh, I enjoy talking to people and hearing different points of views and and so on. I'm a believe it or not, a bit of an introvert. So it's good to get me out in public. And then once I start talking, I thought I'm difficult to shut up. But <laughs> well, that's, you know, I'm that's a great a listener in, in crowds, put it that way. <laughs> no, but you're, you're definitely a big contributor here. And, you know, when we see you on Big Daddy Liberty, I don't think you have much of a chance to get in because there's 85 people on the panel. It's hard to get a moment in there. So, but, but here Absolutely. you certainly, I think that, I think, you know, you and I have talked, Rob, and this is, uh, people don't know this offline. You and I have talked offline. I think you really, uh, if I mischaracterize this, let me know. I think you really relish this opportunity to get together with me and have this conversation, uh, not just because I'm outside South Africa, a different view, but I mean, I, I think we really, um, we have a good conversation and I think you really enjoy it. Did, did, am I wrong or is that on the spot? Oh, no, absolutely. I absolutely do enjoy it. I, I love the interaction. It's it's great. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to have a, a no-holds-bar 
a, a conversation with someone as well. It really is. Well, it's not entirely no holds barred because you know there's certain things we can't say on this platform. But 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 beyond course, that, yeah, beyond course. that, we yeah. we really do um, go out. So Mr. B, who's the top super chatter at the moment, and I suspect might be for all time, but uh, on this stream, but uh, <laughs> 350 might be a bridge too far, 351, but uh, see if I can top that. But but he said, uh, the group thing sounds like a good idea. Erica says, not much, but Rob and Chris is welcome to have coffee with me for free when in Durban in Amanzimtoti, which is down there in Durban. Well, thank you, Erica. Uh, Erica gave us super We'll check you up on that. Yeah, there you go. So, Rob, um, if we were to do this, um, uh, you know, uh, without disclosing things, would Menlin be a good location for this in Pretoria, or is that a bridge too far to get to, or just just a suggestion? Anyway, anyway, if okay. anybody's wondering where, where I do stay, it's in the uh, Rainburg Ruderburg area in in Joburg. So, okay, well that's anyway. why that's why I didn't. I didn't well, then Santon maybe is a good idea too. We can do, we can do something in Santon. Anyway. So. But we, anyway. it's got to be somewhere where you can sit outside. Otherwise, you have to wear a facial covering. <laughs> this is true no well you don't actually if you're in a restaurant you can as long oh, as you're okay. sitting down okay maybe because the, when you're walking into the restaurant you might have to wear it but as soon as you sit down it, it's okay the virus only operates at about uh, six foot or just under six foot so all right well let's <laughs> let's let's we'll try to set something up sometime in the near future because winter's coming people won't want to sit outside when it's winter we, it falls not too bad but we'll set something up uh, maybe maybe uh, one or two coffee dates there in, in Santon and maybe one up at Menlin or something like that Mm, cool. Be fantastic. I, I, Be fantastic. I didn't. I didn't want to give away where you lived, Rob. That's. I was trying to dance around that. You know. That's why I said Menlin. You know. <laughs> 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 oh, I don't mind. I don't know what, what's going to happen. Some presents will arrive at the door. Uh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you leave in a blue light escort, we'll know something's up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, sorry, SABC. No, you got the wrong address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I'm not a member of the cabinet. You've got the wrong guy. Yikes. Uh, Mandy says, I think, whoops, Mandy says, hang on before we wrap up here. Uh, come on. Uh, you came in late, so we're going to go for about 10 more minutes if that's okay. Rob, you good? Okay, cool. I'm good. Okay, so um, where's that? Mandy said, uh, oh, I just lost. Oh, there she said, I think the ANC set Zoom up to get him out so Squirrel could move in. We're terrible, horrific. Uh, Mandy, I mean, that's an interesting uh, theory, but I, I don't think so. Um, Zuma was the head, most people don't know this, he was the head of Mkontowi Sizwe's intelligence. Zuma knows where all the bodies are buried from that generation. So he could have exposed all kinds of senior people in the ANC. And I'm sure he's got documents and testimony and all kinds of evidence buried all over the place in which, you know, if, if, if his life was put in jeopardy, it would have been exposed. And they knew that. So that's why Zuma rose to the top, despite the fact that he's a, a callous, uh, incompetent, illiterate buffoon. Um, who, who thinks that, you know, you can cure HIV by taking a shower. I wish that was true. A lot of people be healthy. But anyway, um, yeah, that's that, I think that's the real reason why Zuma headed the party. And also, people did not like Tom and Becky in the ANC for a lot of reasons. He's arrogant. He's, he's a technocrat. And, I mean, look, look, you know, uh, uh, now he has supporters. Tara Lakota was a big supporter of Tom and Becky. Was he not there, Rob? I know you know, you know Tara from Cope. Uh, but but that that schism, what I call the Polokwane Massacre, that was the party conference in Polokwane when uh, Tom and Becky was unseated. I call that the Polokwane Massacre. That all came down to the fact that, that Tom and Becky was too abrupt, too brusque with people in the party, in the view of many people, and they had enough of it. And, and, and it includes the Radical Economic Transformation Faction, which wasn't identified or called such a thing back at that time. But they're the ones that spearheaded this. And Zuma was their guy. Zuma, And oh, by the way, there's also the element of the first non-Kosa leader to be... Well, I mean, Tom and Becky. What is Tom and Becky's ethnicity? Uh, do you know his uh, I think he's Kosa. Yeah, he's, I think he's Kosa too, yeah. But so this would have been the first... Because Zulus traditionally weren't at the head of the party. You know, Mandela's a Kosa, you know, and Latuli and so on. So this would be the first Zulu. And so there was an element of that. You know, a Zulu ascending to the top of the ANC. There was the, you know, knowing where the bodies are buried. And then there was this just anger and frustration with Tabo Mekki. All of that led to the Polokwane Massacre. Rob, um, thoughts on my analysis? Is it is it off the money or...? No, no I think you're right, right on the money. That's exactly it. And the look at this, some dude in Pennsylvania, some guy in Pennsylvania <laughs> getting this right. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Well, I think it was pretty obvious. <laughs> no, but Chris, Chris, you are you are a wise man on 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 that front, anyway. But there's there's a, a definite relationship and a, a close relationship between uh, Mbeki and um, Terra Lakota as yeah. well. And rumor has it that you know, some of the the party they were encouraged to start. To start cope by by certain factions in there to to counteract what was going on um, within the ANC 
and offer a viable and more trustworthy uh, alternative. Whether whether that's true or not, uh, who knows? But I think there's two sides to to every story. I'm um, sure Mbeki did some really poor, had some really poor decision making, but he also he was quite wise in 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 his approach, um, especially as the president after after Mandela. Where do you go? Where do you go from there? I think he did did quite well. Ooh, I see my earphones have just gone gone dead. So let me let me just move over to something else and see if I can still hear you on on the giant headphones. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you had me for a second. I was, I was, I was panicking. There. I was literally now. Panicking. To be fair, that's, that's something funny. Ronaldo would do. So I just couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so <laughs> so oh, Ma- mandy says uh she agrees with me about that assessment but um uh, why didn't zuma spill the beans who's he scared of well let me tell you why zuma didn't spill the beans is he in prison now nope yeah exactly that's why that's why there's been no push i mean there's no legitimate legal justification for jacob zuma not sitting in prison right now none none exactly and he's exactly. not in there because people fear they feel the retribution. Yep. Now, a lot yeah. of the, the value of that information dies as people go away, but but it still affects some senior people in the ANC. And also, the other reason is is Jacob Zuma has a constituency, a massive constituency now. The cadres who profited from his time in office, the people who ethnically allied with him, the people in the radical economic transformation, the, the schism in the ANC that has split this party into at least, well, multiple factions. I mean, first off, COPE broke away, the EFF broke away, and then you've got the RET and then the whatever factions, plus that's breaking into pieces. Mm-hmm. Too. The ANC is is definitely on the decline, and I don't care what uh, Paul Montashile says about the December conference. It's not going to be the ANC coming back bigger and stronger, better than ever. They they no. they actually, I think, at this point, are deluding themselves about what's going on. They're, they're not even. I don't think they're even cognizant of the rot in their own party. At least some of the people in the senior leadership in the National Executive Committee. That's my view. No, no, I think again, once again, Chris, you you, you, you spot on there. Um, there's this definite panic within within the ANC they know they have to do something drastic to to pull themselves together and I think that's perhaps why Ramaphosa has stated so many times that he puts the party before before the country because he knows the chaos he knows what the chaos that that will ensue after that if the ANC does fall apart it'll be you know, one one faction fighting against against the other and everyone, everyone, including South African citizens, will, will feel the brunt of that. Well, we've already had a taste of it. The July insurrection in the ANT, the ANT yeah. internal insurrection in KZN and especially, but also in Tang. That is a foretaste of what's coming from the internal war in the ANT. That's exactly what that was. That's exactly it, yeah. That was maybe, you know, come to think of it, that, that was probably a, a test. Yeah, to see uh, the reaction. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean there's no what, what else, from the Zuma faction. Yeah. So what else could mm. it be? I mean, you know, this thing is taking place July 8th, 9th, or the 9th is when it starts, the 10th, 11th, 12th. It's like four days before Ramaphosa even mentions the riots in KZN. Meanwhile, billions of rand of, of property have been damaged, lives, people being murdered in the streets, chaos everywhere. Mm. The police unequipped, not trained, not resourced, the military going down there, they can't even feed themselves. They have to jump to the front of the queue for the only station store left, the only checkers left or grocery store. They go to the front so they can get food. You know, four mm. days before even mentioned, then he shows up like a conquering hero in a blue light escort with, you know, $185,000 custom built BMWs gets out with his $40,000 dress suit and walks over mm-hmm. and virtue signals by shoveling some rubbish from a shopping center. Someone's life destroyed, their business destroyed. And and and, and people are like, like lap dogs, arr, 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 clapping for his arrival. I mean, I would have been throwing tomatoes and onions at this guy. That's what I would have been doing. I mean, you're responsible for this. Your government didn't respond. Your government ignored people's homes and lives being destroyed. Radio stations ransacked. What does that have to do with a riot? What does that have? Water treatment facility sabotaged. A mortuary, a crematoria torch. Why would you torch a crematory? It has nothing to do with anything. Anyway, and then a whole container of weapons and our ammunition destined for Cape Town magically appears in Durban and it's looted. Mm. Come on, man. Come on. Joe Biden yeah. answers it. Well, come on, man. Don't make me <laughs> sniff your hair. <laughs> come on, man. And you forgot to mention uh, how many ATMs uh, were, oh. were destroyed and, oh. and ransacked. 
Good point. Millions and millions. And that was just for uh, local elections, wasn't it? So, well, ask, ask that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, opportunity for the government to look like it was actually doing something in response to it. But yeah, it's just, uh, there's a lot of comments coming in. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them because we're going to run out of time here. Although I hate to end the stream, but but we, we, we've got both got things to do. But um, I'm just trying to find something that was, I was looking for here. Um, oh, Helene Helenstock says, Tabo was right about AIDS being caused by poverty and malnutrition. Without getting into a conversation or argument about that, it, it begs the question, if Tabo and Beck was right that HIV is caused or people get it because of malnutrition and poverty, how do you explain that a significant portion of people who contract HIV are wealthy, established, educated individuals? And it strikes that segment of the population more viciously than any other. Why, how do you explain that homosexuals are overwhelmingly hit with HIV infection? And, and, and generally speaking, many homosexuals tend to be established, accomplished individuals in society, bankers, lawyers, instructors, professors, business owners. Uh, that argument, even if Tabo Becky's right, cannot explain how the rich are disproportionately affected by HIV. Sexual behavior can explain it. Intravenous drug use can explain it, but you know, it, it can't be explained by poverty and by by beetroot. <laughs> no, no, it can't. I, mean, I, I agree with you, Chris. It can't. And it, it's again, it's it's promiscuity, and um, yeah, and perhaps that that's maybe the major cause. But if you look, it's it, it's amazing what you can do with statistics. You can yeah. twist statistics to to suit any narrative that that you want. And if you look at the bigger picture around that, then. What is the extent of poverty in the AIDS-stricken region? If it's a high percentage of poverty, well, obviously then it's going to be a high percentage of, of HIV. The two are not uh, correlated in any way. It's a spurious correlation, but it, it might appear to any statistician, st statistician who's presenting those facts or wants to push that narrative that it can be, can be justified. But no, no. We can't look at uh, facts and figures in, in isolation. You have to take all the many environmental factors in, in, into account as well. The totality of the situation. That's why I've always been a holistic intelligence analyst. And that's why when I went to Botswana in 2000 and I went to Maun, I met a lady who was Danish. Her husband was a pastor who was, who was preaching there. And uh, they were on mission. And she ran the Botswana Christian AIDS Intervention Program local office in Maun. I was supposed to interview the director who was from Uganda in Habaroni, but it didn't work out. So when I got to Maun, I saw that they had they had this office there, you know, later in the week. I'm like, okay. So I went by and asked her if I could interview her. And I did. And I gave her my business card. I had a business card which had my GeoCities email address on it. <laughs> That's how long ago this was. And uh, it said, you know, my name. And it said U.S. Army in English and French. And so I gave it to her. And I took a colleague of mine there. And, and, and I interviewed her. And she said, so uh, let me understand this um you're in the u.s army i said yes here's my id card i showed my id card and you're traveling in africa yes why well in the army we have regional specialists who are supposed to be the people advise our leaders about conditions in a place whether it's in latin america eurasia asia you know uh the pacific and of course africa as well in europe and so in order to become a subject matter expert you have to travel around and you have to learn about a place and so they give us a budget we travel around the continent for a year as part of our training program and um, we're supposed to learn about culture and geography and language and economy military diplomacy economic all these things and uh she was fascinated by that she said well why would you want to know about hiv i said well because this is 2000 2000 before this thing blew up massively it was after that that everyone became aware of hiv but people knew about it but it really became crazy after that i said well from my perspective you know and i talked about this a little bit a little while ago hiv is a game changer if you have a significant portion of the population over five percent which makes it a pandemic and we can dispute what a pandemic is that people play these games about three five seven ten percent but if you have a five percent of the population that are affected with hiv this has a deleterious impact on your economy if your economy is weakened then your society's weakened. If your society's weakened, you have national security concerns, potentially. You could have unrest, you could have weakness, a neighbor could take advantage of it. These are all issues that play into it. And so I look at all these issues when I look at the strength of a nation, its ability to respond to crises. And she was like flabbergasted. She's like, wow, that's interesting. And I said, well, thank you. I thought so too. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I'm studying HIV because um, you're not required to, but they ask you to come up with a research topic. You know, it could be about the regional defense, you know, in, in Eastern Europe, if you're covering Eastern Europe. Uh, but for Africa in 2000, when I did my year traveling around the continent, I, I, I said, I want to focus on HIV. And I did. Everywhere I went, I interviewed people in, in, uh, in Abidjan, in the Ivory Coast, about a, 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 um, a vaccine program that U.S. Uh, was running there for CDC. They were trying to develop a vaccine because type 2 
HIV was there. It was present and it's almost non-existent in Africa, but it was in Europe and North America. So they found it there. And so I went over and I, and so she was just flabbergasted. But I mean, that's the approach I've always taken to things. And the point of making that, that whole story there, Rob, was to tie back to your point about you can't look at statistics in isolation. You have to look at the bigger picture. Now, the bigger picture might not have any change to it, but if you ignore the bigger picture, you're probably missing approximate cause of what's going on, or at least a contributing factor. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> cool means. I love it when Rob agrees with me. <laughs> All right. Oh, Rob, uh, is it? go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say, again, back on statistics, it's, it's fascinating what you can do because you can present any truth and, and any story from, from that. And uh, what a lot of people do is they, they have a pre preconceived conclusion and then they work it backwards and try to find the statistics that match that, that conclusion. And that's, uh, uh, that bugs me, bugs me a lot because what you should use statistics for is to try and disprove your, pre, your preconceived idea. Mm -hmm. I have this idea, let me try, find the statistics and, and prove myself wrong. Not to that's, use them the other way around. <laughs> yeah, not exactly. cherry pick statistics to answer your preconceived notion exactly and that's that's a big problem that's happened in 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 the world and in the scientific area uh, a lot lately we've seen that with um climate from climate change to to COVID to whatever else is 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 next we're building models that um that have a predetermined outcome build me a model that can prove this and that's exactly the opposite of what, what we should be doing. And then all the statistics and regulations and, and laws are based on that preconceived idea of what might happen if this model is correct. And show me one model that has been accurate ever. Yeah. I, I cannot, cannot. Well, it's, it's like the argument from leftists, the science is settled. Uh, okay, if you believe science no. is settled, you don't believe in science. <laughs> okay. Correct. Again, Correct. because Pluto, yes. my favorite planet in our solar system, <laughs> is a demi planet. It's a dwarf planet. And if science was settled, it would still be a planet, you know. But they changed <laughs> exactly. that designation based on what they learned about the Kuiper Belt. Anyway, so yeah. so a couple of programming announcements, folks. Very quickly here, um, Mandy uh, Demoy, Lulu Innovation says, when's Rob coming back? Well, Rob and I created this program. I suggested it and he liked it. I, I liked I liked listening to Rob on Big Daddy Liberty. And when I was on the panel, I could see his reactions. I could see that we probably would have a good interaction. And so I suggested and he liked it. I came up with a name for the show. And we've now we've got Kevin has done intro for us. I, I suggested it fortnightly, but Rob's like, no, let's do it every week. And we started, I think, in January. It might have been December, I don't recall. We started and we did it every week, but but sometimes it isn't always possible. Rob was away, not available. I was away, not available. Rob is not available. But the intent is this every Thursday we do this program. Now, the reason I say programming alert is that next week on Thursday, I begin consulting at the U.S. Army War College again for a few weeks. So I won't be available on Thursday to do this. So if Rob and I do this next week, we'll have to move it maybe to Tuesday if he's available because Wednesday is a busy day for me. So maybe we'll do it on Tuesday. But every Thursday, you can normally catch this program. You also go back and watch our previous streams, and um, hopefully you can enjoy those. But Rob and I – now, the one thing that, um, that I like about this program is that for me, Rob is like Quaaludes or Ritalin. You know, it really calms me <laughs> down. You know, I mean, you see me on other programs that go, Big Daddy Liberty. I mean, I've got to get everything in in 35 seconds or Chile will cut me off and go to the next person. So, so I've got to, I've got to, I've got to like, like, I've got to fire like a Vulcan any aircraft gun, get all that stuff out there really fast. And of course, uh, that's fine with me because that's just my nature. Uh, but uh, with Rob, I can be much more calm and sit back and, you know, and let Rob talk for a bit, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's, I, I think, and, and people are saying it in the chat here, that's why I mentioned, it. they say they seem to think that we fit each other really well and they seem to be enjoying it and people are asking about the program so folks it's every thursday uh at the same time six o'clock south africa time unless something comes up uh, rob are you available on tuesday i mean just put you on the spot you know because i mean i think we need to get together again before the 15th if possible just to remind people definitely i am available i'm just checking okay. my diary now okay there's a blank spot there okay uh, so which tuesday. is unusual yeah. <laughs> it's well tuesday. That's, it's unusual for you isn't it <laughs> so it reminds me of, of are you being served it's unusual for me for you mr humphreys yes it is it is <laughs> anyway <laughs> for those who are are you being served fans yeah mr humphreys but uh you know so 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 we'll do this on tuesday again next week uh folks there you go but it's every thursday normally it won't be every thursday for next week the week and i think the week after that because of my responsibilities to army war college uh i'm there during work hours from about 7.30 till 5 o'clock every day, our time, which puts me out of the window for South Africa. That said, I still do live broadcasts from my mobile sitting in my car 
um, with a summary of the news. Uh, it's not the same as here. I can't bring you images because it's just me sitting in the car, but I can bring you the news. I go through the headlines. So I'll still be broadcasting uh, while I'm at the War College. We've done this three times in the past. It works pretty well as long as I have a signal from my mobile provider. Rob, um, let's go ahead and wrap it up. And um, anything that you want to share with people or anything you want to bring up that we didn't get to here today before we, we close this thing? Mm, um, I think I'm, I'm actually pretty good for once. For once, I don't have anything ex extra to say other than promote it, promote the participation. Let's get, get those numbers up. Uh, we had a target set of about 500,000. No, actually it was 1%, 600,000 of, of the population, 1% of the population. Let's see if we can get that. It'll be absolutely amazing. And it will certainly show government that uh, you're trying to divide South Africans. You're trying to divide every everybody about uh, over this certain issue. We're not not falling for it. We're uniting against against this or whatever. I really don't know. <laughs> but no, let's let's get those up there. Oh, and um, yeah. it, anybody can participate and and have this say. You don't even have to be a South African okay. to to say it. If, so if my international audience, opinion, my international audience, yeah. get out there and engage. Absolutely. If you have an opinion on on what it should be if you if you're an expat south african expat even better but really it, it's open to anyone there's no law that says you have to be a south african to have a comment on on legislation within south africa's borders at whatsoever you can even be an angry colonel who interferes in south african in, um, independent electoral commission in transience you can do that in there you go <laughs> there you go and they should fear the colonel fear the yeah, colonel they fear the colonel that's right there you go that should be a show that'd be a, be a reality show fear, the, fear the colonel you know but uh, just a quick update before you go rob um remember the thing in in Zerust where the party um had won the election for a seat in proportional and the iec blew the off the elections analysts then they yeah, blew the party yeah. off then i got lawyers involved um, and they said that they that, that was wrong, that the IC made a mistake, the EFF shouldn't be there, it should be this forum for Democrats. Uh, they went to court because the city did nothing to change it. It's now been five months. Yeah. The court on the 25th of March said you must install it, and they have not installed that member in the council yet. Uh, so I'm going to be exposing this story going forward, too, because um, this is unacceptable. The will of the people is being thwarted by the municipal council in Zerost, and it needs to stop. So I just thought I'd share that. They, with they right. still haven't. They nope. still haven't. Wow. Even nope. after the court case and reading it. Yep. That's, that's, that's crazy. Well, good luck with that. Let's push it from all angles then. Yep. Now, yep. the only question I have for you, Rob, is you have like a million people to support Dear SA. When are those people going to come watch our stream? We need to get some growth there from Dear SA uh, supporters, folks. This is quality content. And unless you're trying to, you know, snare a coffee with Rob, it's free content. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. Well, let's let's actually push it out then. Then I'll, I'll, see, I'll, I'll, I'll actually send it out to if my marketing team will let me, let's put, <laughs> and I'm hinting here, come on, marketing team, let, let us out. Let's push it out. Let's see what the response is. Let's see how people react, react to the show. No, I think we should, I mean, if, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm, in all seriousness, I mean, I, I think I, I think that uh, I'm not aware of you on a regular basis appearing in something like this. I know you appear as a guest occasionally, but this is a case, and, and you're not representing DRSA, but we're talking about the issues of interest to DRSA. Exactly, exactly correct. And that's, that's what I think I value most about this show. It's a, it's a general chat about, about everything, whatever the public throws at us. Let's try and answer that. If we can't, if we can't answer it correctly, we'll, we'll make up a good story around it. But it's a fun time to... We're from the government. <laughs> <laughs> trust us. No. Uh, but what I do enjoy about it is that it's, it's a fun time. We're making light of some serious, yeah. some serious issues. And we making serious issues approachable to 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 the audience and the interaction today especially is, is fantastic oh this was it i really think this is. is this has to be if not the best one of the best programs we've done this is really enjoyable and the chat played a big role in that not to mention the yeah. super chats <laughs> oh yes 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 absolutely <laughs> but the, i think that's a great part of it is is the is the interaction mm -hmm. there's nothing worse than than someone standing up and and preaching to us we, we want to view our opinion we want we want to be challenged that is what the answer to the question is is really all about
Yeah. And just very quickly, two things. Uh, one is a breaking news story that Paulie just gave us, our resident firefighter. And the second is um, a question from R1, which has been answered by Levin. R1 said, do I have to register in order to place a comment? And, and Levin said, no, you don't have to be registered to place a comment. So you can do that. So if you're, no matter where you're at, folks, if you're abroad, go on to DRSA. And that, that's just one of the locations. So we're, we're not you know, we're trying to pigeonhole you into that. But say something about this because you can't let them get away with this. You need all the pressure. As Rob said, if there's an eventual court case to overturn these things, the more feedback the public gave that was ignored by the government makes a stronger case uh, about, um, I, I did infer incorrectly, that's what you were implying right, earlier, right? That's exactly okay, it. Okay, that's exactly I, may, it. I, don't, I don't want to misspeak, so you know, I don't, we don't like fake news here. <laughs> so, and then the other is that um, Paulie has broken the news that um, if you are incapable of identifying the genetic composition of a woman, then you can be a Supreme Court justice. Katanji Jackson Brown or Brown Jackson, what Brown Jackson has been confirmed as a Supreme Court justice. So her inability to attend biology class in junior high school or high school and learn that an X and an X chromosome means that you're a woman and an X and a Y chromosome means that genetically you are a male. Her inability to answer that question means you can be too, you too can be a Supreme Court justice. So just thought we'd share that. And Grant Boost just gave a 700 Rand super chat. Wow. wow. Graham, wow. Um, you moved to the fro, whether you intended to or not, with your stripper chat with no comment there. You too are invited along with Amy and Leo Vin and Mr. B for that coffee, and Erica for that coffee with Rob. And seriously, we'll set something up sometime soon uh, with Fitz and Rob's schedule. All right. Um, that's it, folks. Um, again, we, we have this hazard. We could go for hours and talk about things. But it is getting late in the evening in South Africa, and uh, we do appreciate the international audience. But thanks to everybody. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to leave the program without me declaring this. I am Sky. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I am Sky. Oh, there you go. See, Rob, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed uh, to do. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, look, the world is crazy, folks, but at least we can have a little bit of fun with this, right? That kind of matters. So go check out. Exactly. By the way, there's two sites. There's a, a .org and a .co.za for DRSA. So you can go to both the sites. Um, check them out. But uh, the .org is usually the place where people must go and you can find all the campaigns on there, including the expropriation without compensation. By the way, that's not gone, folks. If you think expropriation without compensation is gone, you are not keeping up on news in South Africa. The ANC is seeking to put that into law, which, of course, will be overturned in a court decision because it's unconstitutional constitutional, I believe, but that won't stop them from putting in the law and then abusing people. So you need to pay attention to what's happening around you folks. Anyway, Rob, thanks a lot, brother. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I'll reach out to you and we'll talk about trying to set something up for coffee with folks. Okay. Fantastic, Chris. And likewise, always a pleasure. It's a highlight of my week. Really it is. No, Thank this you. is a, this is a lot of fun, and uh, thanks for the super chats, folks. This was a lot of fun. You know, uh, maybe I'll pimp the super chats a little harder. <laughs> 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 and thanks for the likes. We were over a hundred likes on this stream, and we went over a hundred on the audience for a long period of time, Rob, which is pretty oh. cool. This is, I think, our best, our biggest, and certainly our most engaged and interesting audience thus far. And to all you out there who are dealing with challenges, loss of family members, feeling kind of down, feeling depressed. Don't, don't, don't think that no one in the world cares. People do care. You just don't see them or it's not apparent, all right? No matter what your circumstances, look for help, reach out to someone. And uh, it, it's, there's nothing sadder than losing someone prematurely. And we don't want to see anyone be lost. So reach out to someone if you can get help. We see Sylvester is reaching out for help. An institution help him overcome the challenge he's dealing with. And, and bless his heart for his, his admission of that in the program. That's a very difficult thing to tell people. Um, I mean, he's already had a difficult time with that username, Sylvester Stalin. We've always wondered about his communist <laughs> tendencies. So if you're still here, Sylvester, you know, we're just giving you a hard time. Anyway, folks. Um, yeah, Amy says, I'm here if you need to chat. Amy's dealt with some horrific, you know, online bullying, which cost her her job. And and didn't destroy her life, but really drove her crazy. Um, and, I, and I'll leave that at there. So she certainly can help people. You know, she can help you understand that, that people do care out there. I know that Amy, Amy really, and if I misspeak, Amy, you can correct the record, but I know that Amy really at some point felt incredibly low and as if it was her against the world and no one carried it 
that's my perception. I mean, if I got that wrong, correct me on the record. But that's, you know, and, 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 and you hung in there and you've overcome it. And hopefully there'll be some justice for these clowns who cyber bullied you. And hopefully they'll get their comeuppance. But anyway, thanks a lot, folks. This has been uh, one of the most enjoyable answer the questions. And we did answer the question. Crazy questions and, and hard questions, Rob. <laughs> we did it. It's time for Francesca to get a little air or get some dinner. I don't know which it is. So I'll let you take care of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amy says, I was going to take my life because of the doxing. You see that? Wow. You wow. see that? And she's a lovely yeah. person. I mean, some people find Amy a little a little imposing, but but she's a lovely person. <laughs> no, but she uh, is but absolutely. she's even thought about it. That's because of doxing. That's that's why when people, you know, it's why you got to protect yourselves, folks. Anyway, and Cameron mm. says Amy's a fighter. Well, yeah, she definitely is. But even even if you're a fighter, people can make you so miserable that you don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. There's always yeah. light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not just a train coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly that. Yes. All right, Rob, that's it, man. We'll, 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 we'll be on Tuesday. So I'll set up for Tuesday and, and maybe we'll set some up for coffee, okay? Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, everybody, for watching. And well, well done for those super chats. Yeah, thanks <laughs> we'll have coffee soon. All right, there you go. So I'm going to put Rob in the, in the waiting room so he can drop off there. All right, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This one was a lot of fun. Um, I normally do a Night Owls an hour. I will do a Night Owls. It'll be a news version. So I'll be back in uh, at 9.30 South Africa time, 3.30 Eastern Standard Time, and we'll cover the news. It'll be a little different than the normal one, but I've, I've got news from today. Some it's worth mentioning, including that Johan Rupert story. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, cool beans, uh, everybody. Thanks, Isabella Thompson. Ian Sky, <laughs> Keith Nordke, Amy says thanks, thanks for support. No, it's there, Amy. Hang in there. Uh, it's uh, well said, Chris says, Fishes. Thank you. Night owls, yes. Yes, Erica, there'll be a night owls. I'll be back. I need to stretch my legs, take a break, walk outside. It was pouring, it was drizzling rain earlier, but I need to uh, take a look outside. Cameron, thank you for tuning in. Congratulations on getting your article written. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. And I'm going to wrap up the stream here, folks, and uh, take care of yourself. See you in about an hour. Really do appreciate your support for the channel. And thanks for the super chats. It was a lot of fun with the super chats coming in. And we really appreciate the likes. This is a cool session. Y'all take care of yourselves. And uh, that's it. Uh, I'm just trying to find my uh, closing video. It's here somewhere. And uh, there it is. Cheers, everybody. Thanks a lot. See you in about an hour.